Hello everyone, my name is Mark Franklin and I'm the President and CEO of CFA Institute. I'm excited to be speaking with you today about the Research Challenge, our 15th season of this incredible competition. Well done to all of you for your involvement and for making it this far. Your outstanding work is truly impressive. To make it to the finals represents an incredible achievement in and of itself. In the wake of the great challenges we have all experienced as citizens of the world this past year, we are so proud of your ability to not only give it your best, but to blow us away with your dedication. This year, about 5,000 students from more than 950 universities competed in challenges in 82 countries around the globe. Simply amazing. And there's no better day than Earth Day for us to be announcing this year's winner. This was our first year incorporating ESG into the competition a true reflection of the importance of young professionals' understanding of environmental, social, and governance factors when it comes to making investing decisions. We know the demand for ESG investing is growing, not only from investors, but from the next generation of talent, a sentiment shared by many of the students who join us today. Employees, particularly young professionals, women, and those from diverse backgrounds, expect more from work than a paycheck. They seek a sense of purpose. Integrating ESG factors into our businesses and investing models is one way to do that. For me, a career in the investment management industry is truly exciting and a way to make a difference in the world. Our industry is fascinating. It covers a broad complex of skills and subjects, such as math, economics, politics, history, and even psychology. It's not all about the numbers. Employers today are looking for a broader range of skills from their staffs in order to deliver for their clients. Despite the public health and economic challenges of today, I encourage young professionals to view this as a time of opportunity, an opportunity to pursue your ambitions. You may have more time to study, for example, or to pursue a professional credential. Employers know that those who combine a professional credential grounded not only in technical skills, but backed with ethics and integrity hold an edge in today's job market. I can assure you that those who earn the CFA Charter are cut above and have demonstrated that they have deep skills to be successful in this industry. The CFA Charter is so much more than a designation. It's the highest standard for all investment management professionals globally. Our charter holders have proven time and time again the dedication, perseverance and commitment that our industry requires. When employers are building teams, they're looking for these precise qualities and achieving the charter demonstrates that you have them. To compete in the career race, employees need to not only sharpen their technical skills, but develop so soft skills as well. As I said, a job in the investment management industry is more than the numbers. It requires communications with fellow employees and of course, clients. Curiosity is critical. You must remain curious along your career path with a commitment to lifelong learning. In finance today, this is an absolute requirement. Our industry continues to evolve at a pace that is rapid and that none of us can afford to stand still. Just look at the advances in financial technology. So keep learning. Our industry plays a vital role in the global economy. We need a strong, vibrant financial system, particularly these days. I'm inspired by the words of our mission at CFA Institute to lead the investment profession globally by promoting the highest standards of ethics, education, and professional excellence for the ultimate benefit of society. As you are pondering your future and what career path you may want to take, please keep that in mind. A career in the investment industry can really help build a better world. I firmly believe that. It's a career choice you can be proud of if you embrace that mission, we can help lead the way forward. And as you consider your career path, I hope your plans will include an aspiration to become a CFA charter holder. CFA Institute remains committed to helping the next generation of investment professionals find success in their careers. We've made significant progress around the world in expanding the reach of our organization and delivering value to those in our ecosystem. This competition stands as a testimony to that. This is indeed a global competition with student teams competing from practically every corner of the globe. And the future of our industry lies with you, the young investment professionals of tomorrow. 
Thank you again for your participation and for being part of our journey here at CFA Institute. I'll now turn it over to Amanda Horner to continue today's program. Thank you, Marg. My name is Amanda Horner, and I manage the Research Challenge at CFA Institute. I'm excited that we've finally made it to this event. We started the competition season eight months ago. We didn't know how much interest there would be in the program as students were navigating virtual classrooms and group work was much more difficult. But we were blown away by the participation and the dedication. And today, we have the top teams from around the world vying to become the next Research Challenge champion. The five teams competing today are the University of Sydney, representing CFA Society Sydney, BI Norwegian Business School, representing CFA Society Denmark and CFA Society Norway, WHU Otto Beisheim School of Management, representing CFA Society Germany, Appalachian State University, representing CFA Society North Carolina, and University of Waterloo, representing CFA Society Ottawa and CFA Society Toronto. The teams will be evaluated by an esteemed panel of judges, including Joelle Arb, CFA, Senior Investment Manager at Octo Investment Management, Simon Ng, CFA, Chief Executive Officer at RHB Asset Management, Jaime Lazaro Ruiz, CFA, Head of Asset Management at Bebe Ubea, Yeshim Tokat Asikel, Director of Multi-Asset Research at QMA, a PGM company. Each team will have 10 minutes to present on their assigned subject company. Following the presentation, judges will have an additional 10 minutes to ask the team questions. Once all five teams present, the judges will break to deliberate. During this time, audience members will have access to a special webinar on ESG investing and the asset management firm of the future in recognition of Earth Day. Following the webinar, we will announce the winner of the 2021 CFA Institute Research Challenge. Before we get started, I want to recognize and thank our sponsors, PGIM and Refinitiv, for making the research challenge possible. Both firms have been integral partners and have provided important resources to help student participants complete their research reports and presentations. I'm happy to turn it over to each of them for a few remarks. First, please welcome our judge from QMA, Yashim Tokat Asikal. This wonderful event. I uh, just want to say a few words about PGIM. Uh, PGIM is the asset asset management unit of Prudential Financial. Uh, we are the 10th larger asset management firm in the world. Um, we run equities, uh, commo uh, commodities, fixed income, and real estate portfolios for our clients around the globe. Um, QMA uh, is one of the boutiques that is owned by PGM. PGM has a boutique structure um, to allow for maximum impact on the various asset classes that we trade in. And QMA is the uh, multi-asset and quantitative equity business within uh, 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 PGM. Uh, I am a senior portfolio manager myself, and uh, I also lead uh, multi-asset research at QMA. Um, we, uh, as PGM and QMA, are happy to be here. We are committed to uh, the next generation of investment professionals that are, um, you know, growing up like you guys and excited about this event and facilitating um, this learning process. Uh, it's great uh, that despite the challenges of this year, you guys have been able to uh, participate in this event and excel. Uh, and share your uh, talent and now knowledge with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yashim. And now a word from Refinitiv. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here representing Refinitiv, now part of the London Stock Exchange Group at the CFA Research Challenge Finals. Everybody who participated gained invaluable experience making solid investment decisions, questioning the status quo, and building expertise that will be useful in their financial service careers. Refinitiv is proud to contribute the data and analytics tools that have helped the finalists make it through the challenge. 
Several years ago, The Economist said that when it comes to data, the debate about quantity versus quality is less important than the fact that the sheer quantity of data is a quality in and of itself. Virtually everything people and companies do on a daily basis generates data. After aggregating it, companies seek to gain insight from it, a process that increasingly depends on new technologies. Some industrial companies now even consider themselves data firms because of the information their farm equipment, jet engines, or automobiles generate. When you enter the financial services profession, you will be tasked with finding ways to leverage this vast amount of data in a manner that benefits your clients. A number of important trends will play a role in your future investing careers. One of them is sustainable investing also known as ESG investing, environmental, social, and corporate governance metrics are changing how asset managers invest, and our clients are increasingly focused on ESG strategies as they look to the future. Our ESG database, gathered from thousands of global companies, provides a window into how companies are addressing these big topics. The data provides a window into a company, providing these opportunities for change. I want to briefly address one aspect of ESG that is finally getting the attention it deserves, diversity and inclusion, which is part of the S pillar in ESG. A McKinsey report found that the top quartile for ethnic and cultural diversity on their executive teams were 33% more likely to have industry-leading profitability, a statistic that's well-proven at this point. Maintaining diversity and inclusion efforts during the pandemic hasn't been easy, but is especially important right now for companies seeking to keep female employees working. Women are leaving the workforce in the U.S. at a much greater rate than men, an alarming trend driven not just by the economic downturn, but by its outsized impact on women. Data show that supporting staff during good and challenging times is more likely to foster loyalty, boost the retention of valuable workers at all levels, and improve performance. ESG is just one trend that you will face in your career. Others, such as cloud computing, AI, machine learning, are others that will increasingly play a role for you. Refinitiv is developing innovative solutions to help you take advantage of these technologies to understand data better and faster. While these trends will make it easier for the future financial services professionals to understand data, it won't replace the human insight that you can provide. The work you have completed to reach the finals of the CFA Research Challenge has helped you develop hands-on expertise with the intersection of data and insight that will benefit your career paths. You have immense responsibility as the future financial professionals to not only make good investment decisions, but to influence our economy and society with your choices. As the future stewards of finance, you must be unafraid to think differently, challenge traditional models of thinking, and do better than your predecessors. Having reached the finals of the CFA Research Challenge, it's clear that you're off to a great start. Thank you and best of luck from your friends at Refinitiv and the London Stock Exchange Group. Thank you once again to our sponsors. At this time, our first team, University of Sydney, is getting ready to begin. Their presentation will start in a few moments.
One. Welcome, University of Sydney. I will start time as soon as a member of your team begins speaking. You will receive a one minute warning and time will end precisely at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Insurance Australia Group is a leader amongst Australia and New Zealand's general insurers, historically generating the highest profitability ratios. However, IAG is facing a perfect storm of headwinds, which will prompt it to lose its shine, warranting a sell recommendation with a 12-month target of $4.32, a 12% discount to the one-month fee well. Over the last five years, IAG has divested its international brands to refocus on Australia and New Zealand and also reduced its struggling commercial portfolio to refocus on its core segments of motor and home insurance under a range of brands. However, IAG's customer growth has begun to flatline as the company grows complacent, and we believe IAG's limited geographic and product diversification will be its downfall for future growth. IAG is particularly weakened in an industry that is faced with the dual effects of rising costs and reduced pricing momentum in a downturn. Generally, insurers will pass on the costs of extreme climate losses by raising their premiums. However, with the Reserve Bank of Australia affirming in February that wages growth will remain stuck below 2% for the next three years, household insurance spending will continue to fall. And IAG's premium pricing makes it disproportionately exposed to customers switching to other brands. In the year to date, IAG's share price has fallen further than its competitors, affirming our sell thesis. However, it continues to trade at a 24% premium on a forward price-to-book versus ROI basis, and we believe IAG has further to fall. Therefore, we issue a sell recommendation with a target of $4.32 and a 12% downside based on three key drivers. First, IAG is expected to lose market share in its core products, as well as face rising reinsurance costs, which will cause IAG's margins to converge with the industry. Finally, with the devastating impact of lower for longer yields, IAG no longer deserves its historical premium. IAG's struggling commercial portfolio has forced it to refocus on its personal lines, which includes home and motor insurance. However, IAG's personal lines will not deliver the desired 3% top-line growth due to aggressive competition and IAG's premium price point in an economic downturn. Within the commercial space, IAG is over-indexed to SME clients and thus hit hardest by the SME exits and downscaling following the rollback of fiscal stimulus and IAG's premium deferral program. IAG will be forced to exit the SME lines ahead of the plan remediation currently priced in by the market and effectively restrict them to their personal lines. However, within personal lines, IAG's motor insurance will suffer from a knock-on effect for aggressive competition in the compulsory third-party insurance market, also known as Greenslip. With 50% of Greenslip customers bundling with motor insurance, IAG's 6% Greenslip market share losses will have a severe flow-on impact on IAG's motor volumes as customers bundle with cheaper competitors. Further, IAG faces intense margin pressure in home insurance, where their leading market share makes them over overexposed to a forecasted 21% contraction in dwellings approvals. Rising costs, driven by heightened climate risk, is also set to outstrip policy premiums, placing downward pressure on margins. Aggravating these factors, IG also faces higher switching rates as growth in their digital channels expose customers to online aggregators, making it easier to comp compare prices and policy coverage. IG's 20% premium price point renders them unattractive to increasingly price sensitive customers who are set to cut insurance spending by up to 12% in the ensuing low wage growth environment. With its customer base shrinking and IAG unable to execute the traditional strategy of raising prices to mitigate volume losses, we anticipate a price volume trade-off leading to a 200 basis point GWP compression in the FY21 results. Exacerbating issues with its top line growth, IAG is set to experience rising cost pressures from both its claim and underwriting expense, brewing the perfect storm for margin compression. Threat of climate risk comes as no surprise with this being years in the making, and IAG has historically remained unscathed. Leveraging its premium pricing momentum of 5% year-on-year increases across its portfolio, 
IAG has historically passed on cost inflation to its customers, preserving its superior operating ratio. This, however, has come at the cost of becoming increasingly reliant on reinsurance coverage. Premium expense as a percentage of GWP stood at 15% in FY15, increasing to nearly 40% by FY20, significantly higher than its competitors. With impending quarter share renewals, management themselves have acknowledged the prospects of higher reinsurance costs in their first half update. And all this while, markets have been blinded to IG's poor ability to accurately estimate its natural peril budget, blowing out its allowance 11 times in the last 14 years, and the worst has yet to come. Being most exposed to a hardening reinsurance market that has been experiencing low return on equity from years of high payout, IAG's aggregate catastrophe cover is already shrinking, putting downward pressures on IAG's loss ratio to realign to industry average levels of 70%. Additionally, with the optimization program at an end, we see that markets have significantly over-anticipated the scope for further cost reduction in its underwriting activities, offering no saving grace for a company in the midst of a tough insurance cycle. With IG stuck between a rock and a hard place, it will lose its fight to preserve margins and its price on book premiums will no longer be warranted. Beyond underwriting, IAG's investment income will continue to face its own challenges amidst an effective lower bound environment, expected to push realized yields to unprecedented lows. IAG's underwriting profitability has historically allowed income earned on policyholders' funds, the funds backing their insurance liabilities, to flow directly to the bottom line. But this income stream is expected to fall almost 50% from FY20 levels, failing to recover in line with underwriting profits. Following 115 basis points of rate cuts since the start of FY20, Australia's cash rate now rests at the effective lower bound where Reserve Bank commentary indicates it's expected to remain until at least FY24. While markets are far from blind to this fact, the impact of lower for longer rates is yet to be unmasked, with capital gains on held instruments so far more than offsetting lost yields. However, this unsustainable trade-off will soon unravel, as the lower bound leaves no room for further instrument appreciation. For IAG, this lost yield will begin to materialise immediately with $425 million of annual yield deficit expected by FY24, as 75% of owned instruments mature in an effective lower bound environment. Turning now to shareholders' funds, those in excess of the expected claims but required for the regulatory purposes, this low yield narrative is echoed. A recent reallocation in response to market volatility leaves 80% of the fund trapped in fixed income. And contrary to market opinion, we see it staying this way. A re-risking is just hard to justify when equity is costing you 7% to earn a potential 6% on high-yield corporate credit or a highly uncertain equity return, especially where these attract an 8 or 16% risk charge from the regulator. This is further unsupported by a contracted credit fan, undermining any strategy of simply moving across investment-grade spreads. All in, we expect shareholder fund returns to fall 30% from FY20 levels. We valued IAG using a residual income model, dividend discount model, price on book versus royal regression, and equity multiples to imply a target price of $4.32, a 12% discount to the one-month VWA. Acknowledging the continually uncertain macroeconomic environment, we sensitized evaluation to key drivers, including GWP growth, reinsurance and claims expenses, and fixed interest yield. However, withstanding these optimistic assumptions, our bull scenario generates a limited 5% upside. Risk to our sell thesis include investors likely regaining confidence in future underwriting profit growth if IAG were to persist with price increases whilst preserving retention rates. However, we see increasing customer churn during the current downturn as challenges take advantage of the flight to value in insurance policies, minimizing this risk impact on our margin forecasts. Outside of market risks, significant ESG headwinds exist for new CEO Nick Hawkins. In the aftermath of its Swan insurance debacle, IAG has strengthened its social pillar through premium deferral and forbearance programs. However, IAG is a lone move in this space, with both Suncorp and QBE withdrawing from increasingly risky rural books. As IAG attempts to convince the market of its nil exposure to greenfield credit policies, we see its prior mistakes on pandemic contract wording casting doubt on underlying governance. In sum, IAG has lost its shine and no longer deserves its historical premium. 
A restriction to low growth segments and geographies will prevent market share growth. Rising cost pressures will compress margins beyond consensus forecasts. And lower for longer interest rates are a red flag for IAG's investment saver. For IAG, the underwriting is on the wall. We are from the University of Sydney. Thank you for listening. And we now open the floor to any questions. Thank you. Judges, at this time, please turn on your video. As a reminder, stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a judge asks the first question. Time will end at 10 minutes. Feel free to begin. I'll just start with my question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to highlight the fact that most insurers investors uh, invest up to 80% of their portfolios in fixed income in instruments. So uh, can you please elaborate on the fixed income investments uh, held by, uh, uh, by the company, please? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so firstly, talking to that 80% number, uh, while I certainly agree that a lot of insurers hold a similar quantum of fixed income, for IAG, this is a marked increase on what they've historically held. And that can be seen on the graph on the left. They historically held uh, a much higher concentration of equities. Turning to what exactly makes up uh, those interest-bearing investments, as we can see on the right-hand side, it is heavily, heavily concentrated in AAA and AA rated instruments. Uh, as well as government and semi-government semi bonds and uh, corporate bonds and notes. And within those, they also flag material concentrations to the Australian financial sector, so the big four banks. Okay, congratulations yeah, you. for your presentation. Uh, my question implies... Uh, something that we have seen in the Australian market regarding the, the elevated uh, catastrophe claims that we recently saw. And with that, uh, it came uh, some uh, price rate increases that have uh, sustaining time. And I want you to ask if, if these uh, new levels of, of prime rates, of premium rates, could imply a margin expansion that you are not fully considering? Yeah, certainly. I'll take that question. So if we move to slide 38, yeah, I agree uh, that there has been increased catastrophe risk, especially in Australia, uh, given the um, catastrophic bushfires and floods. Um, however, I, we don't think that will lead to margin expansion. Um, first, because uh, the high level of risk actually means that the policy premiums go up to account for that risk. Um, so the, the policies are yeah, price to actually capture the risk rather than uh, make more money from the high levels of risk. And secondly, from um, from that, we believe that the heightened level of catastrophe actually makes a lot of premiums um, quite unaffordable for most um, customers. So for example, home insurance uh, premiums have gone up by 150% and actually by uh, in, in around uh, 50 to 80 years time, around 10% of Australian homes will actually be uninsurable because no one can actually pay. So I think going forward, that will um, play into the long-term uh, long term forecast for IAG and also their long-term growth rate. So perhaps I could quickly follow up with the cost perspective um, with the increased risk from these bushfire-related incidents. So while premiums may increase, we also do see a secondary impact, for example, with its reinsurance expense. So if we flick through to um, slide 43, we know that currently speaking, IG's loss ratio is comparatively speaking to its competitors at an advantage, but we really do see this to be realigning in the foreseeable future, just because of a hardening reinsurance market where um, reinsurers themselves are demanding higher premiums for their coverage, both in terms of its catastrophe related types of coverage, as well as its quarter share arrangement. So with this secondary impact coming from reinsurance, we see that margins will not be um, increasing in the foreseeable future. Oh, thank, thank you, Christine. everyone. Oh. Uh, quick question for me. This is uh, Simon. 
uh, appreciate uh, your thoughtfulness in terms of the evaluation um, aspect and the consideration of the various evaluation method. Um, can you share with us um, a little bit more in terms of the allocation to each of your evaluation method and, and the motivation behind this allocation? Absolutely. Thank you for your question. Um, as we can see the slide in front of you. So at a high level, we've included a fundamental valuation of 50% and a relative valuation of 50%. And the reason for that is we want to isolate IAG specific risk and growth profiles, whilst also recognizing that the Australian insurance sector is quite small with only three major players. So if I can take you first to the fundamental methods our residual income valuation has been weighted four times our dividend discount valuation, primarily because dividends for IAG from FY20 to FY22 are quite volatile. And for a six-year forecast horizon, we don't think those are, are quite apt to, to forecast terminally. And then on the relative side, we have equity multiples, which are a price on book and a price on equity. Um, and we see that there are disadvantages to each of those methods. Firstly, on the price to equity side, earnings have been quite skewed by the recent COVID pandemic. And then on the book side as well, we're seeing that our capital is perhaps isn't as relevant going forward. So instead, if I can quickly take you to our regression slide uh, on slide 75. So this is our final valuation method. Um, and what we've done here is we've taken the price on book versus ROIs for 20 global property and casualty insurers, which we've handpicked. And each of these 20 insurers are similar to IAG in terms of their risk profile, their growth rates, and the segments that they target. And therefore, we weighted this at 30%, which is uh, the second highest weighting. And combining all those together is how we get a good uh, differentiation between the fundamental values of IAG and then also the broader insurance market globally, which we think is quite important. All right, thank you. Well, it was a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, my question is on the business cycle side. Um, so, so you have mentioned several times um, that um, uh, growth is declining, um, you know, kind of a recessionary type of uh, economic downturn type of narrative. Um, I actually uh, trade several, uh, you know, uh, macro assets in Australia and the consensus economic growth for next year, uh, for one year forward in Australia, is 3.8%, uh, with an inflation consensus forecast of 1.9%, so, and an unemployment rate of 5.7%. Um, so, as you know, um, we obviously, COVID pandemic uh, did um, uh, create a recessionary environment for for most uh, most countries around the globe, but there's been so much fiscal and monetary stimulus that practically all economies are recovering uh, uh, strongly uh, from this, uh, barring another COVID, uh, uh, you know, uh, resurgence. Um, so, how does that affect uh, your whole analysis? Because the premise is recessionary, which I think is uh, maybe when you started this was was the right environment, but is not the current environment as a consensus. Sure, I'll take that question. If we move to slide 35, um, we, we can see that uh, indeed inflation has uh, gone uh, is forecasted at 1.9%. However, wage growth remains low at 1.25%. And so with inflation um, outstripping wage growth and also IAG's planned prem, um, premium increases of 6%, much in uh, much stripping outstripping wage growth, we do believe that their uh, pricing strategy simply is not sustainable going forward. But even apart from that, um, following the recent results of the Royal Banking Commission, a lot of consumers are aware that big banks and insurers such as IAG are overcharging for coverage that is simply unnecessary. And so we do see that um, prompting a lot of consumers to switch to challenger brands that have more transparent pricing and more tailored coverage. I um, mean, yeah, simply none of the unnecessary coverage that IG uh, has currently. Uh, so just to round that out, um, you are absolutely correct in that Australia has fared quite well amidst the pandemic. We have very strong uh, GDP, GDP growth outlook, uh, but we see wage growth as somewhat disconnected to that. And that in itself is quite pandemic related. Australia has fared well, it has good growth outlooks, and we think that that is going to attract huge levels of Im immigration and keep wage growth kind of planted around this 1% figure, even though broader GDP growth might be higher.
Thank you. Uh, is, if there's still some time, a quick question for me this time and again. Um, can you comment on um, the IAG uh, recent in the early part of the month of March that comments on the uh, zero exposure to green seal collapse? So they have make a claims that they, they have zero exposure. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I'm happy to take this question. Um, so at a high level, um, IAG used to own a subsidiary in Australia called BCC, and they wrote trade, trade insurance policies to Greensill. Um, and they subsequently divested that company to Tokyo, Maine. Uh, and as part of that agreement, acquisition agreement, they agreed to take the exposure for all those credit related policies. Uh, so once Greensill entered administration, people were turning to what you're seeing on the left uh, which is an outtake from the Credit Suisse Supply Chain Finance Fund um, PDS document. And it says that Insurance Australia Hi. wrote. Thank you, University of Sydney. At this time, the judges will take a few moments to collect their thoughts and make notes before the next university is brought in.
Welcome, BI Norwegian Business School. I will start time as soon as a member of your team begins speaking. You will receive a one minute warning and time will end precisely at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Good afternoon from BI Norwegian Business School. We are here to present our buy recommendation for Vestas with a target price of 1,480 Danish kroner and a 23% upside. We believe the market has underappreciated the following three key catalysts. Vestas' technological mode, which unlocks a higher pricing potential, its offshore expansion maximizing shareholder returns, and its unique position to capitalize on the renewable transition. Vestas is a global leader, producing premium wind turbines along with service solutions. Its business is divided into three segments, onshore, offshore, and services. By the end of 2020, Vestas had a solid order backlog, three times its annual revenues. Vestas distinguished itself by having the longest vertically integrated value chain, covering everything from turbine design to plant optimization. Operating in the wind energy industry, Vestas is by default contributing to a more sustainable future. Vestas is also outperforming its peers in many dimensions of each of the E, S, and G. With the environment, Vestas traces all the waste generated by its turbine and its ecological impact at each individual site versus competitors who only evaluate impact per product line. Regarding the social aspect, Vestas is one of the safest wind turbine manufacturers in the industry with no reported fatalities in 2020 compared to three fatalities reported by Siemens Gamesa. Vestas' governance structure represents the highest Scandinavian standard, with an experienced board and management team, we're confident that the company will deliver best value to its shareholders. With a combined sustainability score of 3.2 out of 4, we found only minor improvement areas and believe Vestas' superior ESG performance will continue to attract ESG-conscious investors. Ellen will now elaborate more on our investment thesis. We believe the market is undervaluing Vestas' technological moat. Vestas consistently spends more on R&D than its closest competitor, Siemens Gamesa. This creates a positive feedback loop. Higher R&D spending leads to superior technology, which in turn leads to premium pricing. The cycle continues as premium pricing allows Vestas to afford the additional R&D. This cements Vestas' long-term competitive advantage. Vestas supply chain is moving towards a digital future. With 60% identical components across onshore and offshore turbines and industrial scale 3D printing, the company has global flexibility. Processing over 100 billion signals per day with predictive analytics, Vestas increases turbine uptime and accurately forecasts energy output. It is also creating utility scale hybrid solutions. Additionally, investors have overlooked the potential from Vestas' offshore expansion. Offshore is set to become a $1 trillion industry by 2040, and Vestas has already made its move. It recently launched the world's largest wind turbine of 15 megawatts, enough to power 20,000 homes. The turbine is designed with standardized onshore components, 
And after the recent acquisition of MGI Vestas, the company is now realizing strong synergies from unified onshore and offshore manufacturing. Due to its corrosive environment, offshore turbines require more maintenance. Compared to onshore, where service accounts for 40% of Vestas' operating profit, offshore accounts for close to 60%. Vestas is the only player with unparalleled service and a global service infrastructure, which can therefore exploit this. With these advantages, Vestas is well positioned for a 24% offshore CAGR between 2020 and 2026. We further believe investors have underestimated Vestas's unique position to capitalize on the renewable transition. Trillions are pouring in from governments and corporations to support the sustainable transition. Renewables are set to become three quarters of the electricity mix by 2050, with wind alone capturing 32% of it. This is because of onshore wind's larger capacity and low levelized cost of electricity. Offshore is also expected to become cheaper than solar over the next decade. Controlling 25% of the market, Vestas' global leadership will be the key to unlocking this energy transition. It outperforms peers through its superior efficiency, highest nominal capacity both onshore and offshore, and best-in-class service. So, with these factors in mind, we believe Vestas is best positioned to capture renewable investments. Sara will now show you how our investment thesis is incorporated in the financial projections. We project Vestas' revenues to grow at a CAGR of 11% over the next six years. Growth will be driven by an increase in deliveries and gigawatts under service. This is a result of increased electrification, green investments, Vestas' tech-enabled services, and its offshore expansion. We also expect Vestas to maintain stable prices, which will further support the revenue growth. We forecast costs to recover quickly after the pandemic, increasing gross margin to 16% in 2026. This is driven by cost reductions coming from supply chain automation, post-acquisition synergies, and input mix optimization. As a result, Vestas will improve its EBITDA margin, reaching 15% in 2026. We expect Vestas to retain its margin leadership due to industry-leading technology. Historically, Vestas has obtained superior profitability compared to peers. We predict this to continue and result in favorable shareholder returns, with EPS growing at 20% CAGR between 2020 and 2026. We therefore expect Vestas to increase dividend payout, reaching 4.8 euros in 2026. We project CapEx to rise as the company expands into offshore. However, this is offset by an increase in operating profitability. With an interest coverage ratio 3.6 times higher than peers, Vestas has solid debt capacity that can readily support its offshore journey. We issue a buy recommendation for Vestas with a target price based on a multi-stage DCF analysis. This model befits Vestas' innovative company profile, allowing us to account for both its aggressive and its stable future growth phase. With cost of capital estimated at 7.1% and terminal growth rate of 3%, we arrive at a target price of 1,480 Danish kroners, which represents a 23% upside. On a positive note, we do see a potential upside for a conservative terminal growth based on the anticipated renewable boom and Vestas' favorable market position. This will result in further share price appreciation far beyond our target price, as seen in the sensitivity analysis. Joel will now expand upon our relative valuation. Now, to supplement our DCF, we conducted a relative valuation where we compared Vestas to four different peer groups, non-Chinese and Chinese wind manufacturers, solar manufacturers, and other green tech companies. We apply a small premium of 10% to Vestas' EV to EBITDA multiple to reflect Vestas' superior ESG and SDG positions compared to its peers, reaching a 2021 EV to EBITDA multiple of 24. This implies a price of 1,507 Danish kroner, a 26% upside, which confirms our buy recommendation. We expect a potential repricing of Vestas 
as we believe it should trade at multiples closer to broader green tech companies because of its superior technological leadership. We also conducted a bull and bear case analysis. In our bull case, we determined a price of 1,840 Danish kroner, a 53% upside in which the company fully realizes all synergies between their onshore and offshore segments. Our bear case indicates an 11% drop from its current price, but we believe this is highly unlikely. We also tested our key metrics with a Monte Carlo simulation. We varied WAC, terminal growth rate, megawatts delivered, onshore and offshore selling price, and costs of goods sold. 65% of the scenarios support our buyer recommendation, yielding a share price more than 10% above the current price. We identified post-acquisition integration and innovation risk as the two greatest risks. Post-acquisition risk can be mitigated by pre-acquisition insight and unified production. And innovation risk can be mitigated through high R&D spending and product flexibility. The other risks were either low probability or low impact. We therefore restate our buyer recommendation based on Vestas's technological moat, its offshore expansion, and its ability to capitalize on the renewable transition. For investors looking for a renewable jewel, Vestas is a win-win. Thank you, and we'll now take your questions. Thank you. Judges, please turn on your video. Hi, congratulations on the, on the presentation. Uh, my, fir my first question is about the, the price movement because uh, for years, price of the company was between 400 and 600 and, and in one year it doubled. So I wanted to ask you if all the good news that you are projecting for the future are already in the price, especially if, if it trades at a price to earnings multiple of 40 times or price to book of seven times. Uh, or maybe the good news are gonna be so good that uh, this is just the beginning. Yeah, I can take that. Uh, so I think it's definitely more of a, the good news being the beginning. So Sophie, if you could take us to the peer indices. So we can actually see that Vestas has gone up massively this last year, rising 103%, and then a slightly down now lately. Uh, and I think this is largely because the green investment is starting to materialize. People are seeing that Vestas is the technological leader in this sector. They now have this uh, offshore avenue open for this second revenue stream. And that green investments that are materializing from governments and corporations across the world are really starting to flow into Vestas. But I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Today, we had a meeting in the White House where they said that they're going to reduce climate emissions by 50% by 2030. And just a couple of days ago, uh, Boris Johnson came out and said they're going to aim for 78% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030 as well. So you're seeing just these couple of days that huge green investments are materializing and they're going to be incorporated into the share price over the, this next year, showing even more upside. Yeah, and just to add on to that, we still believe that investors have underestimated the technology mode that Vestas uh, possess uh, and the opportunity of the offshore expansion in addition to uh, investors have overlooked the unique position that Vestas has uh, on the renewable transition. So we actually state that we believe they should trade at a higher price than, than the market says right now. I actually want to build on that question earlier. Um, uh, I agree, uh, you know, with your premise around uh, climate change becoming much more important uh, around the globe with, um, you know, governments uh, doing more to tackle it, to transition to a sustainable economy. Um, but given this huge interest, what do you think are barriers to entry for this firm? Um, why can't other competitors seeing um, the importance uh, kind of uh, cannibalize? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I can take that if you go, Sophie, to Porter's five forces. 
uh, you would see that we have done an analysis on the market and you would see that the uh, we don't actually see such a high threat of new entrants, mainly because uh, the, there are high investment costs uh, that are associated with investing in the best technology on the market. It is also very difficult to replicate all of these uh, turbines and they require a highly specialized uh, machinery that is on the manufacturing side to become an OEM. It is quite difficult and there are quite high barriers of entry. However, what we do see happening is that a lot of the oil giants who want to pivot into renewables, they're entering this market, but they're entering as developers, meaning that they're oversaturating the buy side and becoming uh, actually clients of companies like Vestas. Um, this time, thank you for the presentation. Uh, in fact, I'm also going to write on the earlier two questions as well. In terms of the strength, um, one of the strengths here, or rather one of the pieces that you have is the offshore expansion. And given that offshore represent a very small percentage of the overall revenue contribution, to what extent, or rather, what is your, what is your projection of the contribution from this offshore and, and how would this be really a, 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 a theme that is going to propel um, your, your this um, I mean, your, 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 your proposition. Sure. Uh, Sophie, can you take us to the segment EBIT contribution? Perfect. One of the really surprising things is that um, Vestas gets the majority of its EBIT contribution from service. You could see that we've projected it uh, in our near-term um, stage, the first stage in our DCF. And continuing forward, it's going to be between uh, 50 uh, to 45 percent of EBIT earnings over time. Now, how that relates to offshore is that offshore gives um, Vestas an additional opportunity to increase service on these offshore turbines that they're going to be placing into the water. Really, um, in terms of EBIT contribution, uh, the actual parts and the manufacturing of offshore turbines results in very little earnings um, for the company. It's service, which is really key. Yeah, and just to add on to that, uh, sort of the offshore market in itself is, is, in, is in its infancy right now. However, there's huge growth projected. Right now, it's sort of small local projects in Europe. Uh, over the next couple of years, we're going to see that expanding to globally. We're going to see it popping up in APEC and in the Americas and really expanding to these massive scale projects that you haven't really seen so far. So it's going to be a huge revenue stream in the future. Um, I'll take a question from me. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Very, um, a very good one. I just asked you if you could tell us more about the growth strategy and mainly on acquisitions and synergies over the past years. Yeah, so if you go to the innovation risk uh, slide, actually, Sophie. Uh, thank you. Uh, you would see that basically over the past uh, years, uh, Vestas has made several acquisitions. However, the key ones were like Avalon and Upwind that you can see there in the corner uh, in terms of multi-brand uh, servicing. And uh, right now, the most recent one is uh, Mbao acquisition, which is required for their offshore expansion. However, going forward in the future, we expect that they will mainly um, rely on organic growth uh, because there are not that many target companies right now in the market and they're already quite well equipped in order to uh, jump into the offshore expansion with their MVAL acquisition and they're already equipped with predictive analytics and everything that they need in order to uh, boost their service margins in the future. Well, I have another question. Uh... When you did your, your comparable analysis valuation, uh, you assign a 10% premium on the enterprise value EBITDA multiple. Uh, so it, it took it to 24 times. And I was uh, looking at the Chinese companies at 30 time, 13 times. So uh, my question is, as an investor, uh, how can you convince me not to do a per trading going short Vestas and long a Chinese company because of these uh, different valuations? Uh, yeah, I think that's an excellent question. So if you go to the China slide, Sophie. Thank you. Uh, so in China right now, they have an OEM structure that relies on very low upfront costs, but very high maintenance costs. And this is only very popular in China. 
However, in the rest of the world, they're going more for the Vestas model, where they have higher upfront costs, but the total cost, the levelized cost of electricity throughout the entire project is much lower. And what we're seeing is that these Chinese companies aren't really able to go into the rest of uh, the market in terms of the world. They're staying local in China. So their growth potential is mostly domestic. And we're also seeing a trend in this domestic market more towards Vestas's model, which will just lead to further upside for Vestas. Uh, so in many ways, these uh, Chinese companies are quite contained in their market, whereas Vestas has this global expansion. Thank you. Um, and what uh, would you like? What type of uh, measures or uh, or decisions that the company would take um, would make you change your recommendation? Sure, I could speak to that. I, I think one of the uh, triggers where we would change our recommendations if we see Vestas consistently missing some of their offshore targets going forward into the future, uh, if those don't materialize. Additionally, if we see other uh, companies pull ahead in some of their technology offerings, specifically in service, that would also cause us to uh, change our recommendation. However, we stress this in our bull base and bear case analysis uh, and, and determined that Vestas is still in a very strong position and a, a lot of these uh, negative triggers are, are unlikely to materialize. And if I can add on to that, if we go to the sensitivity analysis uh, slide, you would see that we have actually sensitized the, the average selling price and the megawatts delivered, for instance. And you would see that it requires like a huge amount of drop in these things, around 15% in order to change our recommendation to sell. However, we don't think that this is very likely considering that Vestas has had premium pricing so far in the market and they have uh, actually delivered quite a lot of megawatts in comparison to their peers. Yeah, thank you, team. Um, time. Would you be able to walk us? Time. Thank you. Thank you, BI Norwegian Business School. Thank now, you. Thank you very much. The judges will take a few moments to collect their thoughts and make notes before the next university is brought in.
Welcome, WHU Otto Beisheim School of Management. I will start time as soon as a member of your team begins speaking. You will receive a one minute warning and time will end precisely at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Dear audience, warm welcome to the presentation of Leo's results of the CFA Institute Research Challenge on TeamViewer. TeamViewer is a German, globally operating software as a service company with a comprehensive power portfolio targeting a broad variety of different industries and markets. For the most part, however, TeamViewer focuses on providing cross industry uh, services with cross industry use cases. Four out of eight of TeamViewer's products currently do not target a specific industry, but are rather for general usage. In this category is also Xadion. One of the three acquisitions TeamViewer has made so far, with the other two, Upskill and Ubimax, focusing on the augmented reality space. TeamViewer has been incredibly successful, particularly in recent years. Since 2018, TeamViewer has increased its quarterly revenues by 46%. This is largely due to TeamViewer's successful strategy, which relies on three core pillars. TeamViewer aims to expand its product portfolio continuously, to tackle the enterprise market, and to focus on new international markets. Finally, TeamViewer also constantly monitors potential M&A candidates. With Ubimax, it has made its first major acquisition in 2020. And although TeamViewer argues it focuses on its organic growth, acquisitions seem to play an ever more important role for the company, having made two in 2021 already. Overall, we would like to issue a buy recommendation for TeamViewer with a target price of 46 euros and 60 cents. This is equal to an upside of over 25%. Our decision is based primarily on three reasons. TeamViewer's strong growth potential across many different software services, its untapped potential in many international market, markets, and its fine, promising financial performance and strategic direction. That being said, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Philip. Thanks. One reason for issuing a buy recommendation is the TeamViewer is operating in the rapidly growing SaaS industry. For different segments, we have projected compound annual growth rates in a range between 12 and 35%. Thereby, augmented reality stands out with a particularly high growth rate. Since, as we have already heard, TeamView has increased its AI exposure by acquisitions, we believe that the market has not yet fully incorporated this additional growth potential. Moreover, we expect that COVID-19 has fostered profound and long-lasting shifts toward digitalization across industries, providing a solid basis for revenue growth. Considering TeamView's geographical revenue split, we can see that currently only a minor share of sales result from APEC. However, TeamView has demonstrated that growth in APEC clearly outweighed that of other regions. Moreover, APEC offers the largest market in terms of overall size, growth, and spending on digital transformations. While we are aware that the competitive landscape and regulatory environment in APEC pose challenges for TeamView, we still believe that the growth potential in APEC is not yet fully captured in TeamView's valuation. To properly examine TeamView's competitive positioning, we distinguish three clusters. On the left, you can see TeamViewer's most similar peers in size and business activity. In this comparison, TeamViewer stands out by a comparatively high EBIT margin given expected revenue growth. In the middle, TeamViewer is compared to smaller, more specialized competitors. In this clustering, TeamViewer differentiates itself by relatively high revenue given still limited headcount. Finally, the right graph depicts TeamViewer and global SaaS providers. Although TeamViewer's size is certainly not comparable yet, 
past rapid sales growth indicate that the firm slowly catches up. To summarize on the industry assessment, we conclude that TeamViewer is well positioned to capture attractive shares in rapidly growing markets, whereby particularly the growth potential of augmented reality, COVID-19, and APEC seem not yet fully captured in the valuation. And with that, I hand it over to Sufian in the financial analysis. Thanks, Philip. In terms of the financials, we believe Teamier will have a strong performance in the next five years, mainly driven by high revenue growth, improved margins, as well as lower liquidity risk. Looking at revenues, we forecast a 22% CAGR with even stronger growth in operating and free cash flow. This is mainly driven by the expansion in APAC and Americas, them being new markets with significant upside, as well as improvements in the capital structure. Furthermore, a significant reduction in debt and subsequent interest payments is forecasted. For example, in 2019, the debt to equity ratio was over six, which is forecasted to be less than one in 2021. Looking at the gross operating and net margins, they're forecasted to improve. This is due to economies of scale, team viewer being a low marginal cost business model, as well as technological progress with advances in AI and automation, improving efficiency without the extra personnel costs and personnel costs are among the biggest cost buckets for TeamViewer. Looking at TeamViewer's net margin bridge, we forecast that the net margin will increase from 30% in 2020 to 37% in 2025. This is mainly driven by the improvements in SG&A. However, we see that R&D spend is forecasted to increase over the next years. And this is important for TeamViewer to stay competitive and keep on innovating. Finally, Given the factors above, such as increasing margins, hence cash flows, as well as lower debt, we project lower liquidity risk with current and cash ratio going above one by 2023. However, we have to keep in mind that TeamViewer, being a growth-oriented tech company, will reinvest the excess cash flows in M&A activity, among others, as it already has done with two major acquisitions so far this year. Due to this, the cash and currency ratio will not go significantly above two. And with this, I would hand over for the ESG part. Thank you, Sophia. To incorporate existing ESG research, we made use of the MSCI ESG ratings methodology to better understand and evaluate TeamViewer's ESG risks and opportunities. Also, we applied MSCI's ESG industry materiality map, which helps to identify and weigh key ESG issues within the application software industry. And by doing so, we concluded an overall score of 7.4 out of 10 for TeamViewer's ESG rating. This score categorizes TeamViewer as a company that is a leader in its industry in addressing challenging environmental, social, and governance criteria. Just to name two examples here, as mentioned on the slide. Looking at the environmental aspect, TeamViewer is operating on a carbon neutral level since 2018. On the other side, TeamViewer significantly lacks diversity on the supervisory board and the senior leadership team due to a lack of female representation. In addition to that, TeamViewer has recently issued an ESG-related 300 million euro bond, thereby further incentivizing the firm to increase ESG efforts. And now Ananta continues with the valuation part. Our target price of 46.6 euros was achieved through a weighted average of two valuation methodologies the DCF and the comparable company analysis method, with the majority weightage of 80% being assigned to the DCF as we believe that it is a more accurate measure of the true value of TeamViewer due to a lack of a truly suitable peer group. In the DCF valuation, we use both the perpetuity growth rate and exit multiple method based on the EV EBITDA trading multiple for the terminal value calculation. With regards to the other key DCF inputs, I will discuss them in the following slide. For the comparable company analysis, we assign the EV EBITDA forward multiple with the majority weightage of 70%, as we feel it is the most relevant multiple because the software industry is a less capital intensive business and the multiple has relatively limited exposure to accounting differences, which is an important factor considering our peer group. Regarding the key DCF inputs, the 3.91% perpetuity growth rate is based on the weighted average of the average inflation rate, the GDP growth rate of the various operating regions of TeamViewer, TeamViewer's expected industry growth rates, and a regression analysis forecasting the terms, firm's long-term growth rate. TeamViewer's WAC of 7.69% was calculated using a cost of debt of 3.9% and cost of equity of 11.1% derived using the CAPM model. We also carried out a sensitivity analysis for the key DCF inputs, namely terminal growth rate and WAC, 
to see how the stock price changes based on these inputs. Finalizing the valuation, we conducted a multicolor analysis to test our buy recommendation to incorporate uncertainty. We did so by normally distributing the input variables, revenue and cost of goods sold growth, as well as WAC and terminal growth rate figures. Our analysis showed that in 65% of conducted simulations, the implied share price is above our buy recommendation. Hence, we assume that our recommendation is reasonable. Next, Nicholas will continue with the investment risk and finish our presentation. Thank you, Nata. When analyzing possible investment risk, we categorize four different risk classes, business and operating risk, market risk, regulatory risk, including governance risk and the ownership structure, and legal risk. We assess the products and security threats, as well as industry competition pressures, are the most threatening risks due to high probability of happening and significant potential impact. However, we believe the team feels well positioned to tackle these challenges and risks. And finally, summarizing our investment thesis, we once more want to emphasize TeamView's potential for acquisitions, growing exposure to AR, low risk in combination with strong ESG potential, and the lasting and profound impact of COVID on the markets and the firm. Hence, we believe the firm is undervalued, and we issue a buy recommendation for TeamView stock with a corresponding target price of 46.6 euros. Many thanks for your time and looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Judges, please turn on your video. I will start time as soon as a judge asks the first question. Time will end at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Uh, Tai team, this is Simon. Uh, great work. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, first question I have, um, referring to uh, your geographic expansion, uh, you refer to that uh, the the size in terms of the, 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 the market of APEC is small, but you also recognize that, that there's, there's substantial growth opportunity in APEC uh, at the bottom part of this slide number six that I'm looking at. What do you think the company is, 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 is sort of missing uh, that, that they are not putting in to grow this part of the region over the last couple of years? Why is, it, why, why is it identifying the growth future, but why has it been done by the company? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can kick it off this question. So we know TeamViewer is a relatively young company. They are just a few years on the stock exchange yet, so they are still rapidly growing. And as they are coming from a German origin in the center of Europe, they are currently they started with, to work in mainly in the EMEA region in Europe and in Americas because the markets are more familiar. Hence, it took more time and additional efforts to first develop their products and then go one step further to the APEC region. And hence, we see that currently the share is still limited, but we'll expect them uh, to grow this over time. Can you further expand a little bit on, uh, so how do, you, how do you foresee the company will be growing into this region? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, um, well, definitely there is um, team view of one of team viewers core pillars is to focus on organic growth. Nevertheless, we have seen that especially in recent years, team viewer has added many acquisition to its portfolio. And we believe due to the difficulties also in the market, it will also be beneficial in APAC to make use of acquisition to, um, to accelerate growth. And we, and we see from, from the intention of the company as well, that the headcount that they're growing in the APAC region uh, far outweighs that of other regions. It's over 60% in APAC versus less than 50% for, for the other regions. And, and that's for now, that's mostly in the, in the sales offices, while the research and development, they're still mostly focusing on EMEA. So, but I think with the internationality that's going on, this will also help with their expansion in, in APAC. Thank you guys uh, for the wonderful uh, research and presentation. This is Yishin uh, from PGEM. Um, so here, my question is on slide four, you show the, the, the historical price um, and your target price, right? So can you um, tell me a little bit more as to why this firm has not been able to um, break out before? It's underperforming recently, the, its peers, right? The tech index. Um, it's, um, why, I mean, it's been around that, you know, kind of, uh, index level, 
um, throughout the time period you're showing over the last couple of years, it looks like. So what is the market missing? Why is it not um, uh, performing already? Mm -hmm. So one thing we have to keep in mind is as this is last 12 months is, is the period where they were extremely active in terms of news, in terms of um, almost three acquisitions that they did, as well as signing two, two big deals of with Manchester United, which was 46 million uh, euros, which, which was 10% of their the 2020 net sales. So there's a lot of uncertainty that, that is taken into account here. Um, that, that the market is not sure how the acquisitions will turn out. And also recently being IPO'd, the, the market doesn't quite know what to expect. So therefore, there, there is a sort of a discount um, because of those factors. And also, the, the, as um, in the ESG part, we mentioned that they also issued a 300 million um, ESG-related bond. So I think, and if, if you actually broaden the horizon to looking at 2020 in particular, they, they really outperformed the, the indexes. They performed around 30% while, while the indexes were around 7 and 2%. So this from April 2020 to April 2021 is, is really a turbulent time um, for them due to the, the reasons described. Uh, maybe to add a bit more to the sponsorship deal. So after the sponsorship was announced, there was a stock price drop of around 60%, uh, which was quite a substantial amount. And we can attribute this to the fact that TeamViewer, initially, they were not very transparent with the entire cost structure of the deal, uh, sponsorship deal itself. So investors were very worried about how much uh, the com company would be spending in terms of market marketing expendi expenditure. So that is another reason for their underperformance. Well, congratulations on your presentation. Vielen Dank. Uh, Recently, the company launched a new product called Team Viewer Engage for enterprises, uh, and I wanted I wanted to know if if you have considered this on your valuation or how can this uh, impact your your numbers. Um, maybe I can kick it off generally. So regarding our target price, we have also incorporated some bit of uncertainty also regarding new products by making use of the Monte Carlo simulation and normally distributing the input variables, weighted, namely weighted average cost of capital and terminal growth rate. So with new products developed and these changes regarding these input variables, we have incorporated that in our target price. And even though we see uncertainty regarding these input variables, we still see in the Monte Carlo simulation that above 60% of our target price simulations are above our actual target price. So hence, we believe that our target price is fairly robust, even to not yet fully accounted um, input variables. Yes, and, and adding on to that, the, the product was also a result of the, an acquisition. Um, so it kind of also shows their potential to integrate um, the acquisitions they do into their new products. So in the end, that also shows that for the new, the Zalion and Upskill, the, the, the acquisitions they did, that they will be able to turn them into products that the customers will be able to use um, in the near future. Hence, the revenue growth will, will reflect that. Yeah, and Sufyan, maybe if you go to the revenue growth slide again, so we see that we have rather put higher um, revenue growth rates for the, for the time being. Well, it was too far, yeah. For the for the 2025 period, we believe also when um, additionally incorporating the Man United sponsorship deal that these these additional activities will just slowly pay off over time. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna uh, expand on that uh, acquisition uh, mergers and acquisitions. So um, segment of your presentation. So you know a lot of merger acquisitions in this case are tricky, right? So how do you integrate? What is overlapping? Um, how do you deal with internal um, kind of firm dynamics? So what gives you confidence that these things will work out? What are the risks that, um, that they may not work out well? Maybe I can start things off. Um, referring to what, is, what Sufian said uh, prior, just in the question before, I think uh, what gives us a very good indication is that um, that TeamViewer is able to integrate Ubimax, the first acquisition they made in 2020, already in their power portfolio uh, with, with uh, TeamViewer Engage. And hence, um, we feel like if they are able to do it once, 
uh, we think there is a high probability that they will um, be very thoughtful with their future acquisitions and hence also with upskill and um, and um, Xalia. Um, and what gives us another, or what is another good indicator for us is that their acquisitions are very much uh, focused on future, future markets with high future potential, uh, such as the augmented reality space. Um, so we believe that gives us a very holistic picture, uh, but maybe one of my colleagues can expand on the risks we also see. One thing before the risk, we also have to see that the scale of the acquisitions is, is a lot smaller than what TeamViewer is operating currently. I mean, it operates in, in 180 countries. Um, so, so because of the size differences, it's easier to integrate than if there were more similar companies to, to TeamViewer. And they're also targeting niche products. Um, and as you see from, from their product, um, they have a lot of different products, which they can get the, the network effects um, and the cross-selling that goes on. Hence, it doesn't have to be an integral part of the business. It, it can be a separate product that you can sell with, with cross-selling, for example, which, which substantially reduces the, the risk um, and, and uncertainty with if it's going to be successful or not because it's not a key integral part. I saw on your risk analysis that uh, competition press pressures uh, had high probability and high impact, but regardless of that, you mentioned that this would not imply a downside downside risk for for the company. Why is that? Um, maybe I can I can start off with this question. So TeamViewer's bottom line may be affected by an increasing competition in the software industry, where firms can try to gain the edge over one another by offering similar products and services at Hi. lower prices. Time. Thank you, WHU Otto Beisheim School of Management. At this time, the judges will take a few moments to collect their thoughts before the next university is brought in.
one. Welcome, Appalachian State University. I will start time as soon as a member of your team begins speaking. You will receive a one minute warning and time will end precisely at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Hello, my name is Sean and I am joined by Obi, Olivia, Sam and Zach from Appalachian State University. We are presenting a sell recommendation for the Albemarle Corporation with a target price of $95.50, representing a 37% downside from Friday's closing price. We believe ALB is a sell because its business mix and contract structure will prevent superior profitability. Also, its balance sheet strategy to fund capacity conflicts with maximizing shareholder wealth. And finally, Albemarle is not the environmentally friendly pure lithium play that investors think it is. Albemarle is a specialty chemicals company that operates in three distinct industries. It holds revenue and capacity leadership in the lithium and bromine industries and operates in a niche marketing environment in the catalyst industry due to the customizable nature of a catalyst unit. The bromine and catalyst segments acts as a hedge when the price of lithium is low, but prevents the company from recognizing superior gains when the price of lithium rises. For example, let's take a look at Livent, a pure lithium competitor. In 2018, when the price of lithium was high, Livent's gross profit margin was 10 percentage points higher than Albemarle's. Unfortunately, Albemarle's diversified business mix will hurt its success as the price of lithium rises. We also believe that the company's long-term contract structure will prevent superior profitability. Currently, 90% of Albemarle's total lithium volume is contracted. Rising prices puts the company at a disadvantage relative to competitors who rely solely on the spot price. We also expect Albemarle to recognize a lower selling price in 2021 than in 2020 due to customers renegotiating contracts. However, even if we assume that Albemarle can sell lithium at a 10% premium to the spot price throughout our forecast, our sell recommendation still holds. While Albemarle's mature segments act as cash cows, providing much needed funding to the lithium segment, the company's capital expenditures have exceeded its cash from operations since 2017. This means the company must continue raising capital to fund its plans for additional capacity. However, Albemarle's credit agreement restricts its debt to EBITDA to 3.5 after 2021. The company is currently above this threshold, and we anticipate Albemarle will delever throughout 2025 in order to remain in compliance with its agreement and improve its credit rating. Yet, even if we maximize Albemarle's debt to EBITDA and directed all funds toward CapEx, significantly growing lithium unit volume, our sell recommendation still holds. Conversely, Albemarle can issue new shares, but this comes in conflict with maximizing shareholder wealth. When the company issued 1.3 billion in common stock, it caused more than just solution. It raised our cost of capital to 11.1%. Our forecasts now show the return on invested capital never coming close to the weighted average cost of capital, even assuming that lithium demand will grow at a 43% CAGR. We used a benchmark of 2% above and below the WAC to distinguish value creation from destruction. Unless the price of lithium increases to $34,000 per metric ton, a price point we believe is unsustainable, Albemarle will destroy value to grow lithium. We utilized the scores of multiple third-party ESG data providers to compare Albemarle's ratings to its competitors. Despite seeming like an inherently good ESG company, playing a key role in EV adoption, Albemarle has shortcomings that aren't reflected in its ratings. The company scores three out of six on the entrenchment index, which is worse than the average of 2.4. This is indicative of circumstances that bolster the board's power at the expense of shareholder rights. Albemarle's high social rating is driven by perfect community and human rights grades, but Albemarle's social rating fails to reflect the impact that the company has in the communities in which it operates. In Chile, Albemarle extracts lithium from a salt flat in the driest desert on the planet. Lithium production uses over half of the water in the region, which has forced indigenous people from ancestral land. Chilean regulators are currently reviewing how water is allocated, which could cause Albemarle's expansion plans to evaporate. The production of lithium in Australia is not without its own environmental challenges. Hard rock extraction yields tailings, which contain harmful chemicals. 
Albemarle transports these tailings 500 kilometers into Australia's interior, which has sparked protests in the affected region. While EV adoption is an important element of mitigating climate change, an electric vehicle charged from energy produced by coal actually nets more emissions throughout its life cycle than a traditional vehicle. The world currently relies on fossil fuels for over 80% of all energy generated. And until EVs are powered on grids fueled by renewable energy, their environmental benefits will be diminished. While insiders and institutional investors appear bearish on the company, we believe that retail investors view Albemarle as a pure lithium play and are charging up the stock price in expectation of an EV boom. In the past three months, commenters on the company's Yahoo Finance discussion board mentioned three positive words for every one negative word. The bromine and catalyst segments were hardly mentioned, while the lithium segment was mentioned 89 times. We believe that this textual analysis combined with increased volume on Robinhood supports that retail investors are trading with enthusiasm for the lithium segment. Our valuation, however, does not support this level of enthusiasm. We arrived at our target price using three multiple base valuation methodologies and a discounted cash flow. We considered 14 competitors across the three industries Albemarle operates in. However, we ultimately chose one clear comparable for each of its segments. For lithium, we utilized Livent, a U.S.-based lithium pure play with similar South American brine operations. For bromine, we identified Israel Chemicals, and for Catalyst, WR Grace. We derived our forward multiples by averaging these companies' historicals weighted to each comparable segment's percentage of total revenue. This methodology yielded a 24 times PE and a 12 times EV to EBITDA. Multiples on the high end of Albemarle's historical range are justified by our growth expectations for lithium. However, they do not justify how investors are currently valuing the stock. In order to more directly account for Albemarle's business mix, we valued the company using a sum of the parts approach with EV to revenue multiples. We priced lithium at 8.5 times revenue, higher than Livent's historicals due to Albemarle's superior market share and ability to fund growth with its other two segments. We value bromine and catalyst consistently with industry averages. Our sum of the parts analysis yielded an implied total EV to revenue of 4.2 times above all of Albemarle's historicals due to our high lithium multiple. Even when we price lithium so high that it is 78% of the value of the business, we still cannot justify a buy. Our fourth valuation methodology is a discounted cash flow. While we grow unlevered cash from operations at 19% for the first five years of our forecast, significant capital expenditures forecasted based off of Albemarle's capacity expansion plans will negatively impact free cash flow. Our 11.1% WAC is heavily dependent on Albemarle's cost of equity due to its premium equity valuation. Our 2021 intrinsic value estimate supports our relative valuations. Our final target price of $95.50 represents a significant downside from last Friday's closing price. We compared our valuation to that of other analysts and found in the last two quarters of 2020, they raised their target prices by nearly 70%, despite no changes in earnings expectations for 2021. Instead, analysts inflated their forward PE multiples. We're confident in our estimation of fair value, and it does not support those multiples. We tested the sensitivity of our target price by stressing the major assumptions in our forecast with the Monte Carlo simulation. This indicated a sell 98% of the time. We found that our target price was most sensitive to our lithium unit and price assumptions. However, even if we assume a 73% CAGR in unit volume, our sell recommendation still holds. We also considered several other risks. New methods of lithium extraction have generated buzz in the industry, but with experts stressing the primitive nature of this technology, we believe the industry's optimism is premature. If lithium extraction is the buzz, then sentiment surrounding mainstream EV adoption is the whole beehive. However, we believe overly eager investors will get stung as EVs continue to be plagued by weakened consumer confidence, driven by a time-consuming charging process and costs that the average consumer cannot justify, areas which the new infrastructure bill fails to adequately address. There's also a risk that Albemarle will seek additional expansion, but without direct assistance, we believe this to be highly unlikely due to the company's funding constraints. With a $95.50 year-end target price, we recommend a sell for Albemarle due to its business mix and contracts limiting profitability, its balance sheet working against shareholders, and the mischaracterizations of the company. 
Thank you. We will now open the Zoom for questions. Thank you. Judges, at this time, please turn on your video. I will start time as soon as the judge asks the first question. Time will end at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Uh, hi, team, and thank you for your presentation. I just have a question on uh, the ESG grade. And uh, uh, the sector is not helping, but technically you're saying ESG grade is not, uh, is not good. Have you thought of any measures or actions the company is taking to mitigate this? Uh, I've recently read that they joined the UN Global Impact Membership to uh, mitigate and uh, develop responsible business practices. So have you taken that into consideration in your valuation? Yeah, absolutely. The company has made a lot of progress in recent years to target some certain initiatives like that. But in their most recent sustainability report, they talk about how these issues are important, that they're doing things about it, but they don't, uh, they don't establish any goals that they're trying to accomplish. They just uh, explain measures that they're taking. And keep in mind, Albemarle is a leader in two of the segments in which it operates. So inherently, they should have an advantage to take on these initiatives and uh, be able to handle the expense of additional disclosure. And unfortunately, compared to some of their competitors and their size premium, they kind of underperform in that issue. And these issues have been around for decades. So actions in the last two years, they're definitely very important that they've taken them, but they're also a little bit disappointing if you put it into a historical context. Well, congratulations on your presentation. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the so-called super commodity cycle that could come uh, when the world gets out of the, of the COVID recession? Uh, I don't know if this has been incorporated in your Monte Carlo simulation because it gives you only, uh, it gives you 98% probability of a sell. Obi, can you please go to profitability, please? Yes, sir. We do expect the price of lithium to increase at a significant rate. We grow it at 14% over the first five years of our forecast, a 14% CAGR. The issue with Albemarle is that it's not going to realize a large benefit with these improving prices. If you look at the top chart on the top left of the slide, you can see the profit margins for Albemarle versus the industry. And if you notice during 2017 and 2018, this is whenever lithium prices hit their absolute peak. And the profit margins for the entire industry hit their peak as well. Albemarle's, however, remain stable. If you can go to the gross profit margin slide as well, please. Absolutely. In our forecast, we believe that the price of lithium is going to improve. And with it, so will Albemarle's profit margin to a degree. But the fact that 90% of its lithium unit volume is already contracted out for two to five years is going to limit the benefit that it receives from those improving prices because it has a fixed revenue structure. Let me also add that uh, there, is a, there has been a lot of commentary in the commodity super cycle. And I believe it was at the end of 2020, there was a lot of hedge funds taking positions, betting on that. But since then, in the first quarter of 2021, those, posi those positions have actually reduced a little bit. I, I have a hard time understanding. Uh, well, thank you for the for interesting presentation. Um, uh, so I, I do trade commodities as part of my portfolio, actually. And um, commodities, um, you know, there's been a lot of underinvestment in commodities and um, they're with the growth picking up and with the whole energy transition, there's certainly going to be... Um, um, uh, kind of an appreciation um, that I, I expect. So I'm wondering why, help me understand why you think uh, the firm is not able to capitalize on this and why it can't mine more, for example. You, I understand some of the, um, uh, the agreements are already in place, long-term agreements, but why can't it mine more? Why can't it uh, benefit from uh, a higher price. Can you go on, uh, repeat that? I know you covered it, but I'm not quite sure. I get I'll start it. us off here. Oh. Mm -hmm. I believe this one. Yeah. So the, the company's uh, ability to fund additional capacity is restricted by 
a financial covenant in its credit agreement, which, which restricts its debt to EBITDA to 3.5 after 2021. They're currently at about 4.0. And in their latest earnings, the management mentioned plans to reduce that um, debt to EBITDA level to pay off some of their debt. So the only other way, uh, if, if they don't want to raise debt, the only other way they could raise money to build additional capacity beyond what we forecasted which currently is already tripling. It's going from 85,000 metric tons to 225,000 metric tons by 2025. Despite that, the company still doesn't manage to reach the buy price. Additionally, if, as I mentioned, they, if they aren't able to raise money through debt, the only other way would be to reach out to the market, but that erodes um, shareholder value because of their uh, ROIC and WAC components. And when the price of lithium rises, we expect Albemarle to benefit from that. However, it has two other segments that will hurt its profitability relative to the other competitors, such as Livent, who rely more on the spot price and are a pure lithium competitor. Obi, if you can go to G2 real quick. Yes, and sir. after supply and demand, and then I think we'll we, go next. We do realize that this is a sensitive point in our forecast, so we stress test that. And we found that our sell recommendation wouldn't change unless the price of lithium would grow to approximately 40,000 tons by 2025. And to put that in perspective, it hit its peak in about 2018, around $19,000 per metric ton. And that was a price level that was just unsustainable for companies further down the supply chain. The price that we have in our forecast is based off of supply and demand estimates that we got from other analysts in the industry or from companies in the industry. We used a demand CAGR of 43%, and that's higher than the estimates of Albemarle, Benchmark Minerals, Crew, and Roskill. They all had a CAGR of about 33%. And that ended up pushing our lithium spot price to around $14,000 per metric ton, which is also higher than the long-term estimates of Morningstar and UPS. U UBS, excuse me. <laughs> well, we have talked a lot about price, uh, but uh, let's talk about demand. Uh, even if the company is not a pure lithium play, as you, as you have exposed, uh, valuation uh, of companies like Tesla that uh, imply a lot of, of growth for, for batteries in the future can be uh, a major risk for, for your valuation or, and your assumptions. What are your thoughts, your thoughts on this? Uh, because it, it seems that uh, one company is pricing something and your company is not. Can you go to... EV to EBITDA multiples? Yes, sir. We're really looking over historicals. And back in 2019 and 2018, we had the exact same story. Analysts that were following Albemarle had the exact same story. And that was that they are positioned to capitalize on the growth in lithium that's inevitable with the coming EV boom. But there wasn't a massive change in the valuations of these companies until recently. It seems as though analysts have been following these retail investors that are just trading with such strong enthusiasm for this company, whenever really now we believe that the, it's being valued well above intrinsic value. Yeah, this is Simon. Uh, just a follow-up question to this as well is the uh, two of the theses that you have here um, base quite a fair bit in terms of the receptiveness of, 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 of investors in believing that um, the, the, the balance sheet funding is no, is, is, has a conflict with maximizing shareholders well, and, and as well as you know, the, the lithium play that the company is claiming is not as what environmental friendly as what they claim to be. How would you, how would you sort of believe that these investor sentiments is not going to react in, in, in the sort of in, the, in, in retrospective to this? Because I think, I mean, it's not, I, I believe, I mean, I follow your thesis, but how, how are we going to bring this down to, to challenge investor sentiment? That is a great question. Thank you very much. Um, 
So one of the analysts we we one of the analysts that was following Albemarle was had a strong buy. I believe their target price was somewhere in the 180s, maybe 170s. And they they cited 2021 as the year of volumes. However, the company postponed some of their capacity expansion in 2020 because of the pandemic and have recently re reinvigorated uh, that. Time. Oh. Thank you, Appalachian State University. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This, Thank you. At this time, the judges will take a few moments to collect their thoughts and make notes before the final university is brought in.
Welcome, University of Waterloo. Please stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a member of your team utters the first word. You will receive a one minute warning and time will end at precisely 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Grocery retail in Canada is widely regarded as stable and mature. Empire Company Limited, the second largest player in this space, has new management that continues to turn around the business unlocking value for investors who are hungry for return. Following the recent launch of Empire's second multi-year initiative, we are pitching a buy recommendation on the stock with a target price of $47 per share. Before we discuss our investment thesis, we first want to share what led to this turnaround story. As a consumer staple, the core of Empire's operation is grocery retail, consisting primarily of conventional, discount, and premium stores. This is supplemented by real estate investment in Crombie and Genstar. In 2013, Empire acquired Safeway, a Western Canadian grocery retailer, but integration issues led to impairment charges totaling $3 billion in 2016. This sparked a management turnover, starting with the appointment of CEO Michael Medline, who wasted no time in launching Project Sunrise, a three-year initiative to start turning around the business. The three-year project consisted of realizing various cost efficiencies and was successfully completed in May 2020, achieving $550 million of EBITDA expansion, 10% more than originally forecasted. Despite its success, Project Sunrise only narrowed the gap between Empire and its peers. In order to realign its margins, there are still further improvements to be made, which brings us to Project Horizon. In July 2020, led by the same management team that exceeded expectations of Project Sunrise, Empire launched another three-year initiative called Project Horizon that is twofold in nature, growth in market share and greater cost discipline. This leads to our investment thesis that management will continue to turn around the business as they execute on Project Horizon. More specifically, they will achieve this through their solidified base, realigned core, and industry-leading growth initiatives. First, in order to realize the benefits from Project Horizon, Empire requires a strong base to build upon. Through our primary research that included data scraping locations and determining distances, we found 70% of Empire stores were conveniently located within a 10-minute drive of Canadian. Given minimal industry store turnover, Empire stores will continue to be conveniently located and are best positioned amongst peers to capitalize on the long-term demographic shift to suburban areas that was catalyzed by COVID-19. Empire's strong real estate positioning is attributable to their investments in Crombie and Genstar. The complementary nature of these businesses to Empire's core operations is critical in facilitating competitive store locations. We believe Empire has solidified its strong positioning, which lays the foundation for Project Horizon. With this solid base, Empire is set to execute on Project Horizon. One of its major initiatives is realigning core offerings to capitalize on long-term trends. 
Private labels have higher margins and continue to grow faster than national brands. Given their attractiveness to consumers, we expect Canadian market penetration to close the gap versus other developed nations, indicating more runway for adoption. Our team conducted primary research using a basket of goods and our own consumer survey to create this price quality matrix. We found that while Compliments offers quality in line with its price point, the brand lacked awareness amongst consumers. To address this, Empire rebranded Compliments, leading it to outperform all private labels in fiscal year 2020. Through a discussion with industry professionals, including the agency who led the rebrand and our team's additional research, we expect Compliments to continue its strong performance, benefit from increased private label adoption, and catch up to peers. Empire has also successfully rebranded their Freshco banner to capitalize on the rise of discount grocers. Discount is growing faster than conventional in Canada, and penetration lags other developed countries, again indicating more runway for adoption. Leveraging this successful rebrand and favorable long-term trends, Empire is replacing underperforming conventional Safeway stores with Freshco stores, which better align with Western Canada's preferences. Empire is training Western Canada's economic headwinds into company tailwinds. With these rebranding investments, Empire is set to capitalize on these industry trends and bolster its core private label and discount offerings. Lastly, Empire is investing in a best-in-class e-commerce solution and industry-leading premium grocery store. E-commerce as a whole has seen a jump in adoption due to COVID-19, and grocery is no exception, as confirmed through our team's consumer survey. To capture this rising trend, which we expect to continue growing post-pandemic, Empire entered into an exclusive partnership with Ocado, the world-leading solution for picking and packing e-commerce grocery orders. While competitors rely on individuals to prepare orders, Ocado's robotic solution has lower variable costs and is substantially more scalable. Ocado is a long-term solution to a long-term trend that best positions Empire compared to alternative short-term solutions used by peers. Empire's national e-commerce platform, Voila, not only outperforms peers on long-term financial performance, but also stands out for its value proposition to consumers. After benchmarking each service using a basket of goods, user experience analysis, and Amazon's website traffic analytics, we found that Voila is the only offering in first or second across all metrics. Acquired in 2018, Farmboy is a premium grocery store offering high-quality products, including their own private label, and prices that are 30% cheaper than its competitor Whole Foods. Another part of their value proposition is their quality customer service, as illustrated by their near-perfect store rating, based on 686,000 Google reviews. This proven business model has demonstrated impressive same-star sales growth and industry-leading margins. Given its superior metrics and a product offering that resonates with the greater Toronto area, Empire plans to strategically double the store count of Farmboy by the end of fiscal year 2024. Moving on to our evaluation, which is composed of both relative and intrinsic methodologies. For our comparables valuation, our universe consists of competitors and comparable businesses. We remove Costco and Walmart as they both operate under a different business model. Empire currently trades at a slight discount to peers on an EBITDA basis. For our intrinsic valuation, the primary driver of value is the margin expansions. We expect EBITDA expansion to be 50 basis points over the life of Project Horizon, which is driven by private labels, Freshco, and Farmboy, while being partially offset by Voila, which is dilutive in the short term. Additional assumptions with regards to growth, discount rates, and terminal value were made to get to a valuation of $41 for the retail operations of Empire. Our intrinsic valuation is a sum of the parts, where we valued Crombie using a NAV model and Gemstar at carrying value given it is privately held. Since the three businesses are complementary, no conglomerate discount was applied when consolidated. Ultimately, our intrinsic valuation comes to an applied share price today of $45 with an upside of 14%. Using an equal weighting of all valuation methods, we found a 12-month target price of $47, indicating a 20% return. Investors continue to treat Empire as a show-me story, so major stock catalysts include earnings beats and the achievement of Project Horizon Milestone, which is consistent with the stock performance over the course of Project Sunrise. We have identified a few risks that Empire's business faces, and we'd like to analyze the two largest risks, being Empire's failure to realize cost savings and our dual-class share structures. 
we recognize that Project Horizon initiatives play a pivotal role in our valuation. To quantify the risk that no benefits are realized, we projected a conservative status quo case, which resulted in a minimal 3% downside to its current price, showing that any success of Project Horizon offers upside. Second, we recognize that Empire's public Class A shares possess no voting rights. Along with a variety of other mitigants, we believe the market's rising confidence in Empire's management, as demonstrated by realignment of multiples following their appointment, justifies placing no discount on the non-voting shares. Even if there were a premium for the voting shares, we found the impact to our target price to be less than 6%. Although the lack of voting rights did negatively impact the company's governance score and our internally developed ESG scorecard assessment, we believe the risk is well mitigated for the reasons mentioned previously. As ESG ratings are both an art, both an art and a science, our scorecard incorporated dozens of other material factors, such as the company's focus on food waste, employee satisfaction, and management incentives. After performing the same ESG analysis on its peers, Empire Score gives us reassurance that they are indeed an ESG-friendly investment. In conclusion, management's proven ability to execute on its strategic initiatives gives us confidence they will unlock value through Project Horizon. This solidifies our overall investment thesis that the turnaround story is still ongoing, which is why we see a bright future on the horizon for Empire. Thank you very much for your time. We now like to open it up for any questions. Check. Uh, before we start the judge Q&A, we just want to make sure that the team member that dropped that we can hear you. We just want to do a quick sound check. Noah? Yeah, I think it should be okay. Okay, great. We can hear you perfectly. Thanks. Okay. Um, judges, if you can please turn your videos back on. I will start time as soon as the first judge asks the first question. Time will end at 10 minutes. Feel free to begin. Well, congratulations on your presentation. Uh, Empire recently announced a buyback of 5 to 8.5 million shares. Does this can impact your valuation in any way and how? So we do know, yes, they did increase their normal course issuer bid. And we actually see this as a positive because we also agree that the shares are undervalued. And if we look... The, the company recently was double B rated with their bonds, and they've been buying back debt as well, which brought them to triple B, so investment grade. So we see this not really impacting our discount rate as we'll be buying back both debt and equity. And is, is this the best way to use cash now? Why or why not? So if you just because look at of, their... Oh, go ahead, Noah. Uh, because of COVID-19, they've actually had seen an increase in operating cash flows. So they do have excess cash right now. And as Brendan mentioned, the stock is undervalued um, in our opinion and management's opinion. So buying back shares is a good use of capital at this moment, as well as historically buying back debt. It was, it was necessary because they were double B rated and investment grade is something that management wanted their bonds to be rated. Thank you, Tim D. Simon. Uh, can you walk us through a little bit on how um, Paye has navigated themselves through uh, the COVID compared to their competitors? Uh, of course, you know you, you have touched on the e-commerce uh, piece of it. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on, on the other areas that they have done it right during this pandemic? Uh, while around the world, we do see retail uh, has taken a, a, a quite a bad hit uh, during this period of time. Yes. So in terms of the impact um, of COVID-19 on Empire's business, we have seen unprecedented same-store sales growth in the double-digit uh, figures. However, in our projection period, we recognize that this is a one-time impact, and we have revenues returning to pre-pandemic levels after fiscal year 2022 as restrictions are lifted. In terms of Empire's uh, reaction to COVID-19, we know that they actually have the highest uh, level, highest hero pay out of all their competitors, which shows that they value their customers um, as well as the safety of their customers, as well as the well-being of their employees. Now, in terms of the impact, uh, long-term impact of COVID-19, we conducted a consumer survey to gauge what trends have arose during COVID-19, and we found two trends are here to stay. 
The first being the increasing importance of cleanliness and safety, and the second being the increased adoption of e-commerce as consumers look towards alternatives to in-store shopping. Um, thank you. I, I actually liked your presentation quite a bit. Um, I, uh, I uh, want to ask a question around the survey, right? It's great that you take that initiative and, and do the survey. So um, how large was the sample of your survey? What was the geographic uh, location? And um, do you, how do you make sure that it's representative of the broad client base uh, that this company has? Yeah, so as Anna mentioned, we did conduct this consumer survey. It was 140 respondents from coast to coast across all of Canada and an age ranging from 17 to about 90 years old and a very uniform distribution across that. And in terms of why we have confidence in our survey, uh, we found that uh, price, quality, and location are the most important factors. Um, and all of this research was backed up by secondary research, and so we had confirmation there. And through our basket of goods, as well as our consumer survey, uh, as well as our industry expert calls, we were able to incorporate this information and really uh, allowed us to gain confidence in the robustness of Empire's defensive moat, um, as well as our overall valuation. So is Canada the, pri the primary market it, uh, of, of, for this company? Canada is the only market. So their stores are located only in Canada. Yes. So um, does it make it more vulnerable because it doesn't have a more uh, wider um, client base than kind of another one? Some of the examples you've given um, tend to be a bit more... Uh, geographically dispersed? So if we look at the Canadian just market overall, Loblaw and Metro are the other two uh, pure play grocers here in Canada. And it's really an oligopoly between those three and all three are purely just in Canada. Costco and Walmart, again, are just different business models in general and they're more global. So we don't see this as a negative. It's, it seems it's just industry practice for these grocers to focus just on Canada. Similar to the US, you have Kroger and Albertsons just focused in the US. Okay, thanks. I will just follow up on your question and continue on the improvement of brand awareness and positioning in terms of market here uh, in Canada. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Yes, so uh, we conducted a price quality matrix to benchmark the different private labels in the Canadian market. So for basket of goods, we actually individually went into each store price the identical basket of goods to proxy a price rating. And then for the quality rating, we conducted our consumer survey to, to gauge perceived quality um, of consumers towards these brands. And we found that historically, uh, compliments, despite offering quality in line with price, they were lacking a little bit on the brand awareness side. But we conducted additional research and spoke to industry experts including Ellen Dougal, who is the VP of strategy at the rebrand at the marketing agency who conducted the rebrand. And he stated uh, that the rebrand the rebrand made packaging more bolder, more vibrant, overall made the, the product more attractive. And as um, private labels are 20 to 30 percent higher in margins, we see this having a positive impact to Empire's product mix. And on top of that, Compliments will move up on this chart to being more favorable and in line with other peers in the market. Uh, can you walk us through a little bit this time again? Can you walk us through a little bit on how you do, um, how you, uh, what is the assumption behind uh, your uh, derivation of your of your WAG um, and, 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 and your cost of equity? Sure. So to calculate our WAC, we first started with the cost of debt and we used the yield on Empire's publicly traded bonds, which was 4.1%. And then we sense checked this with a synthetic credit um, spread with a triple B bond and we found it was largely in line. For cost of equity, we initially uh, went down the path of using the CAPM methodology with a beta of 0 0.2. And we found a cost of equity of 2.6%, which we didn't think was reflective of the risk and return that investors in Empire would require. When we looked at pure beta, we actually found it was closer to zero. So we opted against using the CAPM methodology and instead used the DDM approach to find a cost of equity of 7.3%, which we felt better reflected 
the risk return of investors in Empire. And to calculate our WAC, we assumed a constant capital structure and found 5.7%. Thank you. Well, if if if, if I may, uh, I have another question regarding this buyback of debt. Uh, the company's ratio of debt to assets is about about 47%, uh, which is uh, quite affordable, quite, quite manageable. Uh, so this, this debt uh, buyback is, uh, I guess, not because they want to deleverage uh, the company, but because they want to, to find uh, better financial conditions for, for financing the company. Is this, is this uh, the right approach? So you're right. If we look at just the debt details that they have, we listen here, the coupon rate is more reflective because when the debt was issued under their double B rating, which is actually junk bond rating. But now that they've been brought up to triple B, like you mentioned, they will be buying this back to get more preferential debt treatment in the future uh, as they go on with Project Horizon. And their credit rating was was so low because of that uh, acquisition that, that they had to underwrite. Is that why? Yes. Yes. They uh, took on some debt for the Safeway acquisition and it went sideways and that resulted in the lowering of the credit rating. Uh, could you go through Okedo uh, acquisition and the synergies that were uh, reflected? So just a quick clarifying point, Okado is a separately traded company uh, in the UK. So it is simply just a partnership, but the synergies that we're talking about here are more so working together to launch Wawa's customer fulfillment center. Time. Time. Thank you, University of Waterloo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The judges will begin deliberating. Results will be announced around 1120. That's an approximate time. In the meantime, we're happy to provide you with access to our special Earth Day webinar on the investment process and ESG. Thank you.
Hello and welcome to the Take 15 podcast from CFA Institute. I'm Lauren Foster, and this is the show where we bring you an unbiased lens on investing in capital markets through short conversations with some of the world's most interesting and accomplished people. On today's show, we're exploring a topic that is at the center of some of the most fascinating debates in investing, ESG, or environmental, social, and governance considerations. My guest brings a wealth of experience to the topic. Heidi Ridley is a CFA charter holder and co-founder of Radiant ESG, a consulting firm that advises on approaches to ESG investing and programs that promote diversity and inclusion with an emphasis on culture. Most recently, she was the CEO of Rosenberg Equities, a $20 billion pioneer in systematic investing. Under her leadership, Rosenberg became the first fully ESG-integrated quantitative manager. Heidi tells us how she became an ESG convert and what it has been like to launch a firm during a global pandemic. She also talks about her unique background and how it shaped her path in life. Along the way, we also talk about the threats and opportunities that companies face related to ESG and what it takes to build a strong firm culture. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Heidi Ridley, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, it's so great to have you on the show today. And we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about ESG, um, which you say is probably the single most important change to asset management. So I thought an interesting place for us to start would be for you to tell us your ESG conversion story. How did you become a true believer? Yeah, it, it, it actually is a conversion story. And what's interesting about it is it's a conversion story on both a professional and a personal level to some degree. Um, we uh, at Rosenberg Equities, which is the, the former firm that I was at, we had a pretty successful uh, core equity strategy that uh, we really wanted to take more mainstream. And one of the key markets we were looking at was Australia. It's, an, it's a market that we've always um, you know, really gravitated towards. It's a very sophisticated uh, set of investors that tend to be kind of on the leading edge of, of new ideas. And at the time, this was in 2014, we were told that the strategy really had to be ESG integrated because, of course, Australia was already more at the forefront then. And, you know, we were quants, so we were naturally uh, very cautious about that, given that the ESG data sets were even less advanced than they are now, and really tried to think about how we might effectively incorporate ESG considerations and do no harm to the portfolio, because we were still in the land of, you know, generally speaking, um, not really understanding whether it was additive or, or not, still sort, sort of in the early days. And so we worked actually at the time with the responsible investing team of our parent company and effectively brought in their proprietary ESG uh, scoring system into our optimization process as we constructed the portfolio because we didn't want to affect the investment outcome in any way and at the same time wanted to improve. Uh, the ESG KPIs of the portfolio. So we started that process and uh, it started to go rather well. I thought that the ESG scoring system that they had was pretty well informed and we were not finding that there were any issues with the investment portfolio, which happened to have quite a bit of breadth, which I think is beneficial in, in that context. And uh, Fast forward three years later, I took over as CEO uh, of Rosenberg, and we had an important decision to make because we now had a strategy that had delivered you know, very strong risk-adjusted returns, and we had proven to ourselves, at least, that uh, the ESG considerations weren't detracting. But we also instinctively felt that there were insights in those ESG, um, in those ESG considerations that could have implications for companies over the long term and you know really being sort of strong researchers really feeling like we had um, an interest in a commitment to exploring that and to understanding what kinds of environmental social or governance issues could affect uh, a company in terms of its underlying fundamentals and so we uh, we had started to do some of our own research for example on things like do we think investors actually penalize carbon footprint um, do we think that having 
um, a better diversity profile gives you know some of the more profitable companies a profitability moat. And that was really rich research. And so, you know, that combined with our practical experience managing an ESG integrated strategy uh, successfully really brought us to a crossroads of do we do more ESG versions of our strategies or do we embed ESG considerations into our core investment philosophy? And, and I'll tell you, it was a very multifaceted conversation, especially with a group of quants where you know, the natural instinct is to want to back test your way into confidence. And, and we just weren't in a position to do that. And so, um, you know, the data was still you know, slowly improving. But, you know, the reality is that we also felt we weren't any worse off than anyone else and certainly had the advantage of being, you know, a pioneer in quant investing and having years of experience working with new and, and unwieldy data sets. And so, you know, we went on our instinct uh, as investors and fully in integrated ESG considerations, you know, across all of our strategies. Um, at the same time, you know, my own personal beliefs began to grow as our professional convictions did uh, on this topic. And so I began to share our research and you know, talk more about how critical it is for asset owners to think about the implications of their investment decisions you know, in a broader context. And it was, the, it was late 2017 uh, when I spoke at my first client event uh, as CEO. And interestingly, afterwards, I was told that you know, everyone was so used to hearing um, that perspective from the head of sustainability or the head of responsible investing or the head of ESG, but but rarely a CEO. And um, so really, you know, at that moment, it was kind of eye opening. And I felt like, you know, I really had a responsibility with the opportunity that I had as CEO of a $20 billion quant firm to help raise that awareness and to compel the industry to uh, acknowledge that we're facing profound change and that to see real progress on you know, key environmental, social, and governance issues, we need the capital markets to, to be a key and, and driving force. So that was sort of the, the history and the evolution of, of my journey with it. Great. Well, I guess if we fast forward to June 2020, you did something that uh, I think many would consider very brave, you launched a new firm, Radiant ESG, uh, in the middle of a, a global pandemic, and also at a time in the US, you know, when racial and social justice has come to the fore, and it's taken center stage, and there's obviously far more focus on the S of ESG. Um, tell us what it's been like to launch a firm during this time. It's certainly been interesting. Um, you know, I've been thinking about the idea for some time. I had um, elements of it that had emerged in my strategy and vision for Rosenberg as, as a CEO. And um, so it was something that had been percolating and really sort of synthesized into becoming almost a calling uh, earlier this year. Uh, I certainly had not anticipated that I would be launching a new venture in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, but uh, it's I think that presents sort of opportunities and and challenges uh, at the same time. So it's really interesting. But but I did really feel like no better time than now. I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's time, I really do think it's time for talk uh, to turn into tangible action. And uh, it was time for me personally to pursue something that I felt had true purpose and make the last sort of 10 to 15 plus years of, of my professional career matter. Um, you know, the reality is we, we simply don't see many examples of the kind of firm that, that my partner Catherine and I, you know, want to build. And, um, you know, our, fi our vision was really uh, to create sort of, you know, the asset management firm of the future uh, by embracing ESG considerations as, you know, a, ne a necessity in building sustainable investment portfolios and at the same time, carving a path for women and minorities in this industry for generations to come. And that's that diversity side of it is the part where, you know, progress has been incredibly, incredibly slow. And there really hasn't been material change in the last last decade. So just parenthetically, you mentioned you'd spent 18 years at Rosenberg, three of the last years as a CEO. It must have been a, a gut wrenching decision to to move and to leave. You know, it, it really, it really, really was. Um, you know, when I joined Rosenberg 18 years ago, I was really impressed with 
not only the the investment approach that I thought was quite unique um, and had a logic to it that sort of appealed to me, but really the culture and the people there make it an, an incredibly special place. And it's always been you know, very organically diverse. I, I can't take credit um, necessarily for creating the diversity within the organization, but given my own you know, personal beliefs um, in, in diversity and the power that it has, uh, I certainly spent a great deal of my time as COO and chief of staff and then as CEO cultivating that and, and really trying to bring about the best in that. And, um, it, and it, you know, doing something like that and spending that kind of time with a firm um, and with the people there who the tenure was, you know, there were people there. My, my partner, Catherine, was at Rosenberg longer than me. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to, to not feel very invested. Um, you know, and I was very invested in Rosenberg. I, I you know, really was very committed to its success. I, I continue to be, um, you know, watching it so uh, from afar, I guess, in that way and, and you know, um, championing their success. But it did feel like it was time to take on a new challenge um, and to take uh, a passion I have for key topics in this industry um, and really take it to the next step and try to do things that I really couldn't do um, at Rosenberg just by construct. Uh, and so uh, it's it's a little bit of a leap out into the void, but, um, and it was hard to say goodbye, but you know, I continue to have tremendous support from, uh, from the Rosenberg community, from my for former parent company, uh, in terms of what we're trying to do, and, and really more broadly within the industry. I've, I've spent more time in the last few months talking to just people across the industry in a variety of different roles. And um, the level of encouragement and support we're receiving for this vision we have for Radiant is just, um, you know, it's, it's uh, really exciting, actually. It's, uh, I think we have a lot of support out there. Well, that's great. Um, I want to come back in a few minutes to the culture piece that you just touched on. But before we do, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about Radiant ESG. Uh, we've seen sort of a rising tide of ESG this year, sort of record inflows. How is a Radiant ESG different? Sort of what sets you apart? What is your vision for the space? Sure. Sure. We're trying to, you know, effectively at, at the 50,000 foot level, you know, Radiant ESG is intended to be a diverse owned, you know, truly ESG integrated investment um, platform investment firm. But as part of it, there is another dimension that we think is really important that it augments the investment um, approach to ESG, which is having a, a personal commitment to progressing uh, environmental, social, and governance issues, whether that is through advocacy, through mentoring, uh, through you know contribution to different initiatives that are out there. Um, you know, ultimately, we would like to be able to set aside some of the profits of the company to uh, you know invest in smaller uh, efforts to progress environmental, social, and governance issues in, in a positive direction. So, um, it's sort of got this cohesive you know message to it, but. More practically speaking, you know, we have multiple object objectives. You know, one is obviously we need to deliver superior investment results for our clients. And we intend to do that by, you know, investing in companies that that make the world a better place by being deeply committed to uh, ESG anchored portfolios through investment, divestment, and engagement. And, and I can talk a little bit about that. But you know, we do believe that in doing that, we, you know, we need to be a company that that you know is the type of company we want we want to invest in and that means both authenticity we do what we say um, and playing our part as a team and in, in helping bring about necessary change in our industry as i talk about but also in the companies in which you know we invest and and at the same time to you know really demonstrate that a business led and managed largely by women and minorities can be successful and can achieve sustainable results um, which will hopefully carve a path, like I said, for, for generations to come. I think that is really the challenge, is that diversity today, in a way, I feel like, is where ESG was five years ago, where there's a feeling that there's some sort of trade-off, that you know, if you, if you back a women or minority-run firm, that you're 
it's a do good thing and you're probably giving something up on the other side. And obviously we're firm believers that that is not the case. We led a very successful diverse firm. And I think it's time to, to basically model the way, if, the, if that makes sense. Um, but I do think we have a particular edge uh, when it comes to ESG. You asked about how it's differentiated you know, from other strategies out there. And that edge, I think, you know, a big part of it stems from our approach to ESG investing. You know, we believe that ESG considerations represent economic information that is potentially material. It answers questions that financial statements can't. It's inherently long horizon. And when we use it to gauge management's readiness for, you know, what comes next, it's forward looking in a way that most other company information isn't. And so by working at this intersection of what we call an e ESG ecosystem and fundamentals, we're able to find companies that we believe, you know, will be the winners of the future. And we've adapted what we call an ESG mosaic, which is an approach uh, in which you know, we go well beyond an operational view of companies, which is by and large the focus of most of the popularized, you know, ESG scores from the major vendors out there to viewing the company through a variety of lenses. You know, what what does a company make and um, how how do its product products align with or not uh, impact themes? You know, where a company and its customers and its employees operate, how a company stacks up along uh, purely ethical dimensions, you know, what are consumers saying about the company? And very importantly, I think we need to consider a company's evolution, their path of travel, because uh, all of that gives us, you know, sort of a more robust mosaic um, with which to create a more robust assessment of companies' threats and, and opportunities and therefore as potential investments. And so we, we do worry a little uh, about some of the big passive ESG strategies out there that are really using only one type of ESG information or only looking at point in time company ESG footprints. A lot of them have piled into big tech names, which uh, really only look good along one or two narrow dimensions. And so we worry about performance of, uh, for e ETF participants um, as several of the names that have really run up in price recently. But we also worry that there will be a conflation then of tech and ESG in investors' minds, uh, which is really a mistake. So we're trying to bring more sophistication, I guess, to, um, to this topic. So, so Heidi, let me ask you a follow-up question because I've read this, uh, something that you said that you think that companies face threats and opportunities related to ESG. And that needs to be a core part of a sound investment decision and investment practice. Can you just unpack that a little bit in terms of the threats and the opportunities? Sure. I think the, the threats come in you know, many forms, you know, all of which have the potential to affect a company's earnings potential, its actual fundamentals, you know, its valuation and or it, its risk profile. Um, some examples that I can think of are, are, are the risk of, of regulatory change you know, that results from company behavior running afoul of you know, societal norms that results in regulation. So if you think about tobacco, for example, um, you know, on top of that, you know, I think, you know, besides the terrible health and safety record uh, that they have, there's been unscrupulous, you know, advertising in particular to children and minorities. And through an ESG lens, those companies, you know, look like a risk that isn't worth taking, um, given the increased oversight from regulators globally. So that's that's one example. I think company company decisions in terms of knock on effects in terms of the supply chain, uh, you know, thinking about, um, for example, I think it was last week, there was a large uh, automaker, American uh, auto manufacturer that said it was going to be allocating, you know, $2 billion for an electric vehicle manufacturing site. So that's potentially bad news for suppliers that produce, you know, component parts for combustion engines or exhaust systems. And so the knock on effect to the to smaller suppliers can't be, you know, overstated in something like that. Um, violation of license to operate. So, you know, there's uh, there was a British fashion site that I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that was found to have, you know, significant labor issues in terms of sweatshops and its supply chain. And consumers, you know, reacted by boycotting the site, causing revenue loss, and there was significant, you know, negative news coverage, so on and so forth. And, and I guess that the other one or the final one that I could think of off the top of my head would be 
you know, a, a large social media um, company that was found to have, you know, um, real, you know, uh, sorry, a large social media company that was boycotted by other large companies that protested their social media policy. So, you know, those to me are examples of very real threats that fall under sort of an E, S, or G umbrella, but are really affecting companies at, at their core, you know, in terms of, of their revenues or the risks that they're facing or the regulation or taxation or things like that. The opportunities are almost sort of the flip side of that. So, um, you know, thinking about new products and services that will be in demand. So, um, you know, if you think about the the auto company example that I gave, you know, there are going to be companies that could benefit from that because they're, you know, they're going green in terms of their decision or they supply, you know, EV parts and, and technology. Um, there's increasing, you know, efficiencies, companies that invest in resource saving technology and chart their own path to to efficiency are far less likely to be sort of backed into a corner with respect to technology, taxation or regulation, uh, improving diversity, which we, we've talked about, you know, companies um, are going one of two directions when it comes to diversity, you know, those who are anchored to, to the status quo and those who are evolving. And we see significant upside associated with increasing diversity as, as more and more research, you know, really points to better decision making among heterogeneous groups. Um, and, and then finally, I think anticipating consumer preference. So uh, companies that can anticipate consumer preferences for things like uh, packaging will be ahead of the curve, you know. Um, so thinking about, you know, the influence as well of the next generation. You know, it's funny because some people have, when I was early talking about ESG and, and millennials, they were saying, well, you know, the millennials don't have any money. And so it kind of doesn't matter. But it's it's interesting to me because, you know, number one, as a mom, I do know that millennials and the next generation have a very strong influence on our decision making and our choices, you know, but equally, you know, we're going to see a massive generational transfer of wealth that is going to land in the hands of, of first, you know, my generation and then beyond that. And, and increasingly, those generations do care about these issues. And you can see that through through social media and other ways in which they voice their, you know, unhappiness with what some companies are doing or their praise for others. And so that's where I think um, ESG is not a factor. It's not a concept in an abstract. It, it, these are underlying issues that really are going to affect a company's, you know, future um, trajectory and, and therefore, you know, very, very critical to consider in an investment context. Great. This year, there's been a lot of focus on equity, inclusion, and diversity. I know that when you were at Rosenberg, you were very intentional about building a diverse team. Um, what more needs to be done in the industry, especially in the asset management industry, and, and how hopeful are you that we'll make some progress? I still think we've got a long ways to go. Um, I do think that having more and more um, effort focused on it, discussions about it. I mean, just in the last, I think, three or four months, I think I've spoken on, you know, five or six panels <laughs> all on, you know, diversity. And so that's good news. And uh, that it, it, it is good news that people are at least making efforts to hire or put people in positions that have this role in this remit. The, the challenge will be that you can't get away from the fact that the tone has to come from the top. There has to be genuine belief that it matters and that it makes a difference in order for us to see meaningful change. Because I do think that while there are a lot of efforts, tangible efforts to expand hiring practices, to bring more diverse candidates, um, you know, in the slate of potential people that you're going to be hiring, uh, you know, those efforts will only go so far if you don't have a culture and an environment that draws out the best, that really truly brings about the benefits of diversity, which is the perspectives of those individuals. And so I think that if, if, you know, in my mind, what I mean by tone from the top is that leadership really understands and values what diverse points of view bring to the table, that you're genuinely accessible, that you're open-minded, 
that you almost, you know, invite dissent and different points of view and different perspectives to the table, because that's what I think it's going to take to really leverage the benefits of diversity that we hear so much about and read so much about in all of the research papers that are done around the benefits of diversity. Um, you, you don't reap those benefits just by virtue of having a sea of people that look different around the room if really one or two people are always driving the decision making. And so I think that that is going to be the challenge that I'll be interested to see how much that changes, because I worry that right now, because it's coming a bit bottom up, you know, clients demanding it, um, you know, just the changing demographics and things like that. And people trying to address a demand that they see versus really understanding the true benefits that there'll be, you know, potential efforts that aren't fruitful because, you know, they'll they'll hire a candidate, the candidate will come in, they'll be frustrated because they can't really get their voice across. And then um, and then that's where I think the wheels will start to come off the bus. But but I, I am optimistic because there is a lot more conversation. I do think there are a lot more firms really wanting to understand what it takes. And if they can marry that, you know, with a personal conviction in the topic, then then hopefully we'll see things move. But in the end of the day, it has to change because the reality is that companies are not going to survive, let alone thrive, if they can't reflect the changing demographics uh, and therefore changing needs and interests of their customer base. So let's stick a little bit with this tone at the top, uh, especially as it relates to culture. Um, I was actually listening to something that uh, Larry Fink was presenting a couple of weeks ago, and he thinks a lot about culture and he worries about how remote working will affect culture. And I know that at Radiant, uh, something you think about a lot as well in the companies that you look at is culture. Um, how do you foster a good culture in a company? What are you looking for? And how do you think this remote working is affecting company culture? Yeah, what I, I mean, in terms of culture, what I think is really important is, is a culture of trust and transparency, of communication and openness, um, of collaboration. And, you know, again, what I was really trying to do at Rosenberg um, was really make the employees there feel like we're all putting our fingerprint on the future of the company. And, and therefore, you know, everyone's ideas are valued. Everyone's perspectives are worth consideration. And, you know, there, there were several times when I had very strong conviction in one direction and had my mind changed because of what, you know, I heard from other people. And so I think when you have a trusted space like that, First of all, it's incredible the great lengths that that your team will go for you. Uh, you know, when they feel that they're valued, that you're all in it together, you're rowing the boat in the same direction. Um, there's incredible power in that and incredible motivation in that because you know you're really kind of driving toward a shared um, a shared vision and an outcome. I think the challenges are when firms view employees as um, dispensable, as you know, sort of uh, there for their skill sets and replaceable, and um, and that's where I think you know, kind of having more transactional view uh, about employees as resources uh, really is, is is fraught with a lot of issues. I, I think that when you have built a culture that that's tight, that's tight like that, like I feel that Rosenberg was it's a little bit easier to do things remotely as well because you have a high level of trust. Um, you are already naturally communicating, you know each other on a deeper level. And so, you know, yeah, there are roadblocks and that you're doing it, you know, via video camera on a computer versus, you know, seeing each other in person, but it is a little bit easier to continue to, to try to maintain it, but it does take effort. It does take, you know, making that extra effort to, you know, call people or organize settings in which the team can interact, even if it is virtually. I think that when you're starting out, like I am um, now with a new firm, it's certainly more challenging, but I don't think it's insurmountable. Again, we have this at least technological gift of, you know, Zoom, Skype, WebEx, you know, whatever it is, where we can at least see each other. I mean, could you imagine if this had happened, you know, 15 or 20 years ago? Um, and so I think that, you know, leveraging those kinds of tools and doing more than just 
meeting to discuss transaction, you know, projects and where projects stand and, you know, how you're progressing on different things, but peppering that in with some more kind of social interactions and ways um, to have, you, you know, opportunities for the team to come together and share, you know, perspectives. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? You know, how are we dealing with those? But I, as a leader, for me, what I would be doing is also checking in individually. Uh, with some of my key and hopefully, you know, in a larger organization, that's hard to do. So hopefully that then, you know, kind of translates down. But, um, you know, different staff members are going to have different needs. You know, you've got, uh, even if I think about my my former colleagues, you know, I have, you know, my CIO, Kathleen, has got, you know, four children under the age of of eight uh, at home. And then my co-founder, Catherine doesn't have children, but, you know, has other things that she needs to to manage and, and take care of. And so you kind of need to individualize in a way um, the support that you give employees, I think, in times of challenge and in times of crisis. And I think that, uh, you know, it's not a one size fits all model. Uh, there has to be a willingness to tailor an approach to what what that employee needs. But if you can do that, that goes a really long way in terms of of engagement, of commitment, of loyalty. Uh, and I think that a lot of firms will find that they will get you know far more um, out of their employees by doing that um, than if they don't. So you mentioned sort of putting in the extra effort. and if I, if I look at your career, uh, there are a series of steps along the way where you seem to have put in a lot of extra effort. Um, and I, I would love to um, hear your sort of your personal story. You know, we're all products of our backgrounds, but you have a, a very unique background uh, that really has kind of shaped your career and, and some of the choices you've made. Could you share uh, your background with us, please? Sure. Uh it, you know, my background has definitely shaped um, who I am, and it was not an easy background. But, you know, I do, I am very grateful for the experiences that I went through because I do think it really has given me some of the characteristics that I lean most heavily on and that I think have really served me incredibly well. Uh, I was born in Iran. My father's Iranian, my, mo- my mom's American, and I was traveling back and forth, you know, um, quite frequently in the early years and sort of felt very, uh, you know, equally Persian and equally American. Uh, we were traveling on en route to the U.S. Uh, when I was about 10 years old and the revolution had broken out in Iran. It was not something we anticipated. And so we ended up, you know, kind of trying to rebuild here in the States. It was obviously a very tumultuous time. And my father lost, you know, everything during that during that period, and really had to truly rebuild from the from the ground up in the U.S. And that also meant that we all pitched in, and we had a responsibility to um, to do what we could to, you know, I had a paper route. We were, you know, I was working when I was in high school, and so I had a, a strong view about work ethic and the importance of work ethic early on. I also had very quick visibility into, you know, how destabilizing it can be to not have, you know, financial security and to have things sort of, you know, uh, kind of really fly by the seat of the pants, um, you know, and and so that to me really instilled a very strong work ethic and a very strong commitment to when I do something, it's 150 uh, percent, you know, it can't be partly you know, part part of my brain or I'm, you know, thinking about other things at the same time. It has to be something that I'm deeply committed to. But I also feel that if you if you see someone and, and to this day, if I see someone who really has um, you know, really takes pride in their work and goes the extra mile, then that's someone that you want to to support, to encourage. And I did feel like because of what I brought to the table in terms of of my own um, efforts and really drive to do better, to think about the next thing and think outside of the box, that I had a lot of support as, as a result of that, which really helped me you know, throughout my career. So one thing I had read was that you, uh, I guess when you were much younger, you thought you might open a restaurant or start in the restaurant business, but you somehow found your way into the asset management industry. How did that come about? And, you know, there's a dearth of women in the industry. How do we get more women to come along? 
So, you know, those are two pretty different questions. It's interesting because I think that, you know, I first wanted to be a doctor, then I wanted to be a lawyer, then I happened to work in a restaurant when I was in college and uh, really enjoyed it, actually. And, you know, I'm really kind of a foodie myself. And so I thought I like the social aspect of it. And uh, and so that's what made it kind of intriguing uh, to think about, you know, a career in in the restaurant business. But Ultimately, I, you know, I'm not sure what it really was that kind of flipped the switch and said, you know, I felt like I needed to, I guess I just felt like I needed to get more, quote, serious um, about my career. Uh, and so at the time, you know, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, I pursued a wide range of potential opportunities from, you know, publishing to being an accountant to, you know, all different kinds of things. And I did stumble into a, a potential job with an investment banking firm that was really the start of it. And it was just a great team. I didn't know anything about the the industry. It was an executive assistant position. So I didn't really need to know a lot about the industry, but the team was a really special team and I knew it from the interview process. And so that's kind of what drove me. And I guess maybe therein lies a little bit of um, of an underpinning to, to how I think about teams and culture. But uh, it was a great start and it really hooked me right away. In particular, this idea that you can be in a position to, to create financial stability for others, to help others, you know, retire um, or, you know, just have a nest egg or whatever their financial objectives were. And so that that was a pretty quick hook early on. And and so that, you know, was sort of the start of it. And then from there, I really felt like, you know, I built on that by taking my my CFA and learning more uh, about investing. And it really went all over the place, interestingly enough, within asset management, however. You know, I started out with a sales and marketing, you know, focus. I did RFPs. I went into product management. You know, I've done a variety of, of different roles within, you know, this financial services industry. And so I guess segueing into what it might take to attract others, I think it, I think it's a few things. You know, one, I do think the demographics of the industry need to change. It's going to be uh, difficult for us to continue to try to attract women and minorities to the business if they can't see themselves. And the good news is I've seen and met so many incredibly talented you know, women and, and minorities in the last several months as I've been looking to launch Radia that I'm, I'm, you know, would like to get more of those faces out there and leading in the industry because there's a lot of talent out there. And I think that talent will, will draw other talent to the table. So I think, I think that's one thing. I think the other is to go back to our roots as an industry and what we're here to do, uh, which is to serve our clients and to help our clients meet their investment objectives. And, you know, to do that in the best and most thoughtful way possible and get away from doing things purely for marketing purposes or to gather assets um, and to try to increase, you know, profitability at the margins. And, and, you know, obviously those things are important to run a well-run business. But I think that if we go back to really the core purpose, I think that that will be very appealing to the next generation. And if we add on to that, this incredible opportunity that we have for the asset management industry to play, you know, a leading role in societal issues and and do that with our capital in a way that actually does in, result in better investment outcomes, then that's going to be even more powerful. So I, I am incredibly optimistic where we sit at this point in time with the changes um, that are, you know, the profound changes that we see coming, uh, if we can view it as an opportunity for us to bring about positive change. And I think that that will be an incredible attractor, you know, for the next generation. Just scores are in, and I, for one, am on the agenda. Ready to announce the winner. Check the envelope. And the winner of the 2021 CFA Institute Research Challenge is BI Norwegian <laughs> Business School. Congratulations on this incredible achievement. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. 
<laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the teams that presented today, our judging panel, and our sponsors. A special congratulations to BI Norwegian Business School. And with that, the 2021 season of the CFA Institute Research Challenge is officially over. We'll see you next season.